a late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put them in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Ah, there you are, my friends. Good morning. It's just gone 6 o'clock on Wednesday, the 27th of March. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories for you this uh, morning. Continued Tory turmoil. A double resignation forces Sunak into a mini reshuffle as Education Minister Robert Halfen and the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy yesterday quit their government posts. More time behind bars. Russia extends the detention of journalist Evan Gershevich, meaning he will remain in jail until June as he awaits trial. And the return of the King, Charles, will attend that Easter Sunday service at Windsor Castle alongside Queen Camilla. It will be the first public event since his hospital treatment and that cancer diagnosis. And it's another day of sunshine, but also some hefty showers, spells of rain and hill snow. It's all going on and I've got the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The search for six missing people following the bridge disaster in Baltimore has come to an end, as rescuers say they're now presumed dead. The Coast Guard says it suspended its recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. Several vehicles were on the bridge at the time it fell into the river, and officials have since revealed that the vessel suffered power problems before it issued a distress stress call moments before the crash. Well, Maryland Governor Wes Moore says it will be a while before things get back to normal. This is going to be a long-term journey for our state to recover. But if there's something that I know that has been on full display today, uh, we are Maryland tough and we are Baltimore strong. And we are going to make sure that as a state, we are going to get through this together. We are committed to getting through it together. And we will be in, uh, we will be in consistent and constant communication with the people of the state. Back here, and there are concerns of a continuing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers announced their departure from the party. Robert Halfen became the 63rd politician to say he'll not stand in the next election. He was joined by the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who also resigned. Previously unseen pictures of the Clapham acid attacker getting baptised have emerged as new documents reveal the church that carried it out knew about his criminal past. The Grange Road Baptist Church limited Abdul Azadi's rights to attend services after a sexual assault conviction but then supported his claim to stay in Britain. A new survey has revealed that public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. The long-running British Social Attitudes research shows that just 24% of people were happy with services in 2023, with most people concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. It's a 5% decline since the previous year. And as Easter approaches, a top medic uh. is warning us not to eat a whole chocolate egg in one uh. go. Dr Andrew Kelso's comments calling for moderation to avoid tooth decay, obesity and type 2 diabetes has led to a bit of a backlash on social media. Well, many have replied telling him he's not their mum and that they would now eat two eggs as a result. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. What's his name? You're not my Was mom. that you who said you are going to eat two? Because that sounds what? like something no, you no, would do. Very his name, Andrew Kelso, just do one, you sad muppet. Why don't you let people eat junk? Oh, you'll get tooth decay and obesity. With everything that's going on in the world, the only good thing is damn chocolate. What a miserable <laughs> gitty, is it? <laughs> the only good thing is damn tooth decay. Do you, do you not know See how many fun we have on, in our lives? Come on, what a miserable... I bet he's a dentist. Well, yeah, well, no, if he was a dentist, he'd probably be quite happy for a bit of Just brush your teeth after you've eaten two eggs. Make it three. You're not going to eat any chocolate eggs, are you? I don't really, no. She no, I don't chocolate. really eat chocolate. What about but you? She can have a sugar-free... Yeah, maybe, maybe. Oh, maybe. maybe. There we go. I'm sure that exists. Sugar-free, vegan, vegan... I whatever. like a good old-fashioned Cadbury egg. Do you? Yes. I once made a giant cream egg. You know, like the, the 
the Easter egg, these massive ones, I filled it with icing sugar. It was wonderful. And you Very bad. Yours. Amazing. How do I eat mine? You've seen how I eat mine because we had, <laughs> we had two of them for breakfast the other week. Right, you're going to be getting in touch with us this morning, as you always do. But today we're going to be asking you more Tory MPs. 63, they reckon, yesterday, right? Are going to be, well, are, are quitting in time for the next general election or they won't be running again. So we're asking you, today is the Conservative Party facing wipeout at are the they running? Are they basically election? bolting before, before the inevitable happens? Also, uh, this is a really interesting one and, and I will be at odds with everybody today. When we talk about energy and all the green lot jump up and down and go, oh, let's get it right. Let's, let's build some wind farms. Starmer's has been off to Wales. Here's a question for you, which is really relevant. It's like all those people who go, we need more houses. Yep. Would you like a wind farm on your land, would you? Do you own land? You know what I mean. <laughs> people will go, oh, let's get some houses. And then when it's in their constituency and their air, uh, we're asking you, would you support a wind farm in your area? To be fair, a lot of them are going to be floating ones, so you'd have to live by the sea. You floating the wind, sea. there's a thought. Floating wind. And we're also asking, is it OK for MPs yeah, is my thing. to go on a three-week recess over the Easter holidays, considering the state that the country's in, yeah. particularly at the moment? So you can email us, talk today at talk.tv. You can text uh, talk plus your message to 87 treble two, but on to our top story for you today. Yes, fresh chaos for the Tory party overnight as two more MPs quit, uh, forcing Sunak to organise a mini reshuffle. Leo Doherty has been appointed the Armed Forces Minister after the departure of James Heapy. And Luke Hall is now Education Minister in the wake of Robert Halfen's sudden departure. Uh, we're delighted to be joined now by our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards. Good morning, gang. How morning. are we? Yeah, Good all right. Morning. So I was sitting at home yesterday and this news came in. I thought, oh, this is going to be like Boris Johnson. There's going to be six of them and it's all over. Yeah. It seems, though, Alicia, that, that these two, and I liked Halfen, I think he did a lot for people in terms of, of, of motorists as well. But it seems that both of these had already decided and let it be known that they were resigning, taking it to more than 60. They are... This is rats abandoning a sinking ship, excuse the pun, isn't it? Well, you could say that for sure. I mean, we have to remember, before an election, people always do resign. There's always a bit of movement there. What, Lots this many? Say, but, wait, give me a second. Oh, crack <laughs> on, I'm busy. Blimey. <laughs> I'm busy from doing what? <laughs> She's got <laughs> it about... Do. It's like being married to her, isn't it? <laughs> Lots of argument and nothing uh, else. Wish, Crack you on. Wish. Um, <laughs> really? This has got really weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's too early. Anyway, anyway, um, MPs. That, yeah, so there's so many Conservative MPs who've decided they're standing down. And I think the thing that's really important is it's a mixture of people who joined in 2019 and veteran MPs who've been here for the long haul. These two MPs who are standing down, they didn't cite any personal reasons about the party or to Rishi Sunak. Both the resignation letters were very loyal to him and very much just suggesting that it was just the right time for them and that they kind of reached the end of their of their run be, being an MP. There wasn't anything that would suggest it's because they don't like the direction of the party. But we have seen that in the past. Mm. And lots of MPs are just choosing to be a bit more diplomatic about the way that they resign. Absolutely. Paul? Do you think there's going to be someone else leaving within the next 24 hours? I think they're going to get to about 100. I think really? there's a whole load waiting in the wings. And they're all obviously polishing up their CVs. They don't want to be the last one out the door and everyone's got the jobs already. So I think there is this government in its death throes feel. Uh, people are going to be bailing out. And they're Paul, do you think Sunak holds on to the election? We had many, Yeah, many, I think so. You know. I, think, I think the alternative now is too dire for even the Tories to contemplate. Why you should know? anybody else take what he's caused? Well, that's so. right. So let, let the blame go with him. Yeah. Uh, and, which, is, uh, which is if you were thinking... As a lightning about conductor. It, if you were a Penny Morden or you were, a, I don't know, generally, of course, like yeah. That, why would you want to take the rap? You'd wait till the aftermath. Yeah, yeah, you? that's, I'm afraid, the calculus they're going through now. But I mean, I think there'd be more MPs going out because uh, why would you hang in there? It's really interesting, though, because, of course, you know, normally they're desperate to be ministers. Mm -hmm. They're desperate to climb that greasy pole and all of that. And now they're just jumping off it as fast as they can. I think that's also a really good point in that I, and I don't want to be insulting to the two new people who've taken the, the roles, but most uh, who people are haven't they? heard of them. Yes, quite. I mean, I mean, like, you know, I do this every day. And for, I, like, I was like, I don't know anything about Luke. Well, I think you need to brush up on your work, for goodness sake. You just sake. get back in your box. <laughs> 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 It's true, though, right? Do you remember at the end what of Boris you Johnson? Know about they were making Hall? nothing. What do you know about Luke Hall? Yeah, oh, I don't know. Do, do you know, like, you know, in those, the last throes of Johnson's thing, mm. they were asking everybody to be a minister. And they did the cleaner right. at number There's... 10. Everybody was going for it. So, absolutely take your point. I think, and that really does show something within the party. Normally, mm. these are spots that are usually reserved for people who are quite well known. They've worked, you know, for like a long time in the party. Mm. And it's not to say that these two aren't doing anything, obviously, but they are definitely not at the forefront no. of the Conservative Party. And they may party. be fabulous. 
Brits, but we don't know who they are, do we? I'll tell you what I would like to know. ask you both as well is, a um, lot of talk in the last few weeks about uh, how much GDP we put towards uh, mm. defence. And we were talking uh, to Jonathan Ashworth mm. yesterday, and he was talking about how important it is with what's going on in the world. Shap's beginning to put pressure on Sunak about wanting more than 2.5, which I think is a leader's pitch. Heapy, of course, the Armed Forces Minister, also has said in the last few weeks that, that a true Conservative government would have a stronger military. Is that perhaps behind some of these? Ben Wallace as well? Well, I mean, so many people have put pressure on the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to increase defence spending. And then when it came to the budget just recently, a few weeks ago, we mm. didn't see that yeah. increase. What Jeremy Hunt said is that it will be 2.5% if the economic backdrop allows it. So that didn't fill those people who were putting that pressure on him with much hope that we would see a big increase in defence spending. I mean, obviously, defence spending is one of those things that goes up and down, obviously, depending on the, sure. the backdrop of what's happening globally. But lots of people are arguing at the moment, you know, why, why now is it? so low when we, we've got two really, really huge I mean, conflicts. that's the killer argument, isn't it? It's not so much the economics, it's about what's going on on the global stage. And it's obviously an incredibly unsafe world. We need to increase expenditure. I think Labour should commit to a 2.5% Now, I think that's GDP. really interesting. And we did say that to Jonathan Ashworth. And I keep talking yeah. about how, Paul, the, 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 the canvas has changed. I mean, for a Tory party to, to presumably or potentially leave office with the highest taxation in 70 years, no mm. policemen and women on the streets and a really poorly stocked armed forces. Yeah. That's a fact. That's, that's, yes, yes. that's, that's unbelievable for people who would have thought that. And this is their stock in trade, isn't but it? But Defence, Labour, law and order, I like what you be said because I want to hear that commitment. Yeah. I think people want to hear that they're going to be strong. They're not just say, well, when the manifesto. Be interesting to see if they do that, right? You think they will? I think it's possible. I really do. And it's, it's linked, it is linked to the economic argument about growth because it's getting young people into jobs, mm. in, in effect. It's certainly uh, there's an investment in the arms industry and various other things that are good for the economy. But it's mostly it's about our national defence and we are in such an unsafe place. We need an army. Uh, Alicia, let's move on now to an attack ad that was put on Twitter, mm. uh, well, now X, by Susan Hall, well, in, in on behalf of Susan Hall and her, her mayoral campaign. Can you talk us through the furore over that? Well, this is just another one of those classic Twitter spats that we're, we're seeing a lot between the two political parties at the moment. This was Susan Hall, London mayoral candidate for the Conservative Party, putting up an attack against her kind of competitor, Sadiq Khan, who's standing for Labour. And in the background of the video, there were images kind of showing the city and they were basically accidentally images of New York, not of Brilliant. London. Brilliant. So she had to uh, delete the video because obviously that was a bit, bit misleading. I mean, her campaign is a shambles, isn't it's it? This is just a little example of oh. a much bigger pattern of utter shambles. Also, some of the rhetoric in there, it says there's a 54% increase in knife crime since the Labour mayor seized power. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, he was... There no matter what you think about him. There is a 54% increase in knife crime, but he didn't seize power. But whatever you think of him, he didn't seize power. We actually do have a clip oh, we can yeah. show you. Let's take a look. Seized. A 54% increase in knife crime since the Labour mayor seized power has the metropolis teetering on the brink of chaos. And in the chaos, people seek a desperate reprieve, egged on by the Labour mayor who wants to decriminalise the use of illegal drugs. They tried, to, City. It's very, they tried to make it a Batman oh trailer. Dear. It's very, very odd indeed. Desperate, very sinister, isn't it? So <laughs> desperate. But do you not think Labour have been accused of, well, they have over the past year of using pretty desperate tactics themselves, you know, certain attacks on Rishi Sunak. Is there, this not the Tory party just getting their own back? No, I think this is a new low, and it's not even done well. I don't mind attack ads if they're witty, they're clever, they speak to some truth, but this is just nonsense. What about, what about people <laughs> dressing up as chickens and parading? Yeah, there you are, exactly. Do you remember that Sunak like. like in Sainsbury's when he pretended it was his car and it turned out to be a walker, and that great one we were told earlier yeah. about... Train gate for Corbyn. Do you remember that? Well, he, I do, yeah. Said, well, I, I'm standing, there's absolutely nowhere to sit, and they yeah. actually got video for you've been walking through completely empty You'd think the chairs, that people yeah. like you, no disrespect to you, would go, mate, it's totally wrong. What's of course. wrong with you? Oh, like, social media is even more wrong because yeah. somebody can just disprove it within seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, well, thank you Thanks, to gang. Alicia Fitzgerald and former Labour advisor Paul Richards. Thank you both. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Mail focuses on the Clapham acid attacker who claimed he was a devoted Christian to win asylum. Now, Abdul Azidi, a convicted sex offender, failed the religious test but was allowed to stay in the UK. Now, the Times says one in four believe the NHS is working. A satisfaction the health service falls... Oh, she just said only one in four falls to a historic low.
and Heartbreak Bridge, cry the Metro, as rescuers searched for survivors affected by Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge, which collapsed after a container ship veered off course. Well, to Russia now, and the country has extended the detention of Wall Street journalist reporter uh, Evan Gershevich, who is being held without trial. The US says it's using Americans to achieve political ends. The 32-year-old journalist who had lived in the country for many years was accused by Russia of espionage, something he and the paper vehemently deny. Well, Alexander Vasiliev is an expert on Russian security services and he joins us in the studio now. Good morning, Alexander. Now, Russia says that he is being held on espionage charges. We know that that's not true. Well, I'm not sure about that because to answer this, uh, to give you a definitive answer, I need to read uh, the file. I need to read the documents the FSB has on Ivan Gershkovich. He hasn't even had a trial, though. How can he be guilty? No, 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 he hasn't, but the, the, there must be a file on him. The thing is that... Uh, let me uh, say it first. I have no idea whether he is a spy or not, right? So the things I will be saying... I don't believe he is at all. I will be saying things I will be talking hypothetically. And hypothetically speaking, uh, the fact that he is a reporter for the Wall Street Journal doesn't necessarily mean that he can't be a spy. The, the Wall Street Journal is obviously not a branch of the CIA. This isn't... This isn't I'm going to be really honest with you, my friend. I, I don't want to have a debate because I think he's completely innocent. I want to hear from you about the state of Russian jails where a man has innocently been kept for the last 12 months. I'm not sure he's been innocently kept. But he's been held there without trial. Why hasn't he had a trial? That I don't know. But let me, let, me, let me say this. Do you think he's being used as a pawn in a political game here? He obviously is, yes. yes we is, that. But the uh, thing is that journalism is one of the most popular covers for, for spies all over the world. Look, 35 years ago, I but was... But Evan Gershevich is not a spy. And how, we do don't, you know, how do you know that? Well, we don't want to get into the... A debate. Because it, it hasn't is, been it hasn't proven, been proven that, that he is. There is no proof, but there is a suspicion. And theoretically speaking, he might be a spy. Right. So how can we trust anything, though, that the Kremlin is saying about... You, we, we, don't, we don't have to trust anything Kremlin is saying. The thing is that uh, journalism is the most popular cover for, for spies all over the world. And the, the reason for that is that journalism and espionage a very similar profession. Both right. professions are about... What will, getting... the, uh, what will the conditions be like in those jails? I think he is... I, I'm pretty sure he is being kept in uh, good conditions as far as it is possible in Russian jails. I'm pretty sure he's not being... Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to leave it there, because I tell you I disagree with you and I believe that Evan okay. Gersovich is an innocent man who is being paraded... Uh, and left without a trial by Russian authorities, it can't be excused. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, KGB historian Alexander Vesivli, I can't even say the name, still to come and talk today. The alleged chemical attacker who was given asylum in the UK despite failing a Christianity test, and Christian Hall has been caught up in a neighbourhood dispute over a swimming pool. Well, the Sun's Jack Elson and the news movement's Rebecca Hudson take us through this morning's papers next. Do stay with us. It is 6.17. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
May might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to you Talk Today. It is 6.21. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Confidence in the NHS is a shock, Nick. Is it an all-time low with less than a quarter believing it's working? We'll discuss that in the papers next. Well, there are concerns over Chinese marketplace team use use of people's personal data. We'll give you the details at 6.45. And Labour is planning to invest in wind farms off the British coast in a bid to reduce our reliance on foreign energy. Talk Today correspondent, the intrepid Nick Ellaby, is live from a wind farm at 7.45. Don't wait. First, let's take a look at the weather with Naz. Naz, is it going to be windy today? Actually, tomorrow is going to be really quite windy. Lots of energy it, for the yeah, UK. Yeah, exactly. What about Saturday? I want to play golf. Is it going to be windy on Saturday? No. Good. There we go. <laughs> but you'll still be rubbish, though. <laughs> oh! Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I probably will. <laughs> you might be personally windy. I played nine holes the other day and fell down four of them. <laughs> Crack on, <laughs> gaffer. I would if you stopped talking. Let's have a look. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. We're going to continue with this unsettled theme of sunshine, showers, some heavy and thundery spells of rain, hill snow out there this morning as well. And in the next 24 hours, the winds will be rather strong as well. So, yes, it is going to be windy, but they do calm down into the weekend. And actually, we switch to a bit of a southerly airflow, so it will become a bit milder, a bit calmer as well, and a little bit drier for most of the Easter weekend. But it does look like for Easter Monday, it is looking quite unsettled again. So let's take a look at the here and now. And it's a wet start out there this morning across parts of Ireland, Northern Ireland, Central and Southern Scotland. There are spells of rain and hill snow there and Northern England. There's also another batch of wet weather already starting to arrive across parts of the southwest. Now, both areas will be moving northwards through today. So for Scotland, the mid-afternoon picture across the north is rain and hill snow. Further south, sunshine and showers. A much drier and brighter picture compared to this morning for Northern Ireland. But there will be some scattered showers in England and Wales will see showers in between sunny spells. Some of them will be heavy and thundery, especially out towards parts of the west for Wales, the west country as well. And it will be quite blustery, especially later on towards western areas. Temperatures will be around average for the time of year, up to around 11 to 13 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, most of the showers fade away, but towards the early hours of the morning, we're going to see some more wet weather spread towards the central and southern parts of England and Wales. So it's going to be a wet end to the night there, whereas further north it will be mostly clear, dry for Scotland, for Northern Ireland, maybe even a patchy frost in some rural spots. Then throughout tomorrow, 
We do it all again. The areas of rain across England and Wales, two areas, will be moving northwards up towards parts of Northern Ireland, Northern England, Southern Scotland later, and lots of showers in between bright or sunny spells across England and Wales. The far north of Scotland, though, I think staying mostly fine and bright, but central and southern areas will be seeing cloudier skies, spells of rain with some heavy downpours. Northern Ireland seeing showery rain. England and Wales, as I said, sunshine and showers. Some will be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail as well, and it will be very windy, especially in the south. Southwest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, now it's time to look through today's papers with the amazing Rebecca Hudson and the less amusing uh, Jack Elson from The Sun. <laughs> Morning, gang. Can I just get straight Libelous. to something? Because mm -hmm. um, l let me just explain for people tuning in. Evan Gershevitz is a colleague of ours, and everybody in this building stands with Evan Gershevitz. I didn't understand. Uh, you know, my point to that last guest was he hasn't had a trial, right? Yeah. Not a trial. He's, He's been, been detained been... for a year without a child, Raquel. So I'm not continuing an interview with somebody who says he might be. He doesn't know what you're talking about, man. He's been detained for a year without trial. Uh, the media aren't allowed to any of the hearings. He's not even allowed to speak as he comes out for the hearings. Um, you know, it's the classic tactic of Vladimir Putin in his police state to basically try and trump up charges. He's done it to people before. Um, and, and, and the fact that, you know, um, this has even been questioned, you know, the, the, no evidence has been brought forward whatsoever. Absolutely. No evidence whatsoever. It's completely bogus charges. And to suggest otherwise, it's just, um, you know, being a useful idiot to Putin's regime. Bex, for us one on this, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, it's an attack on journalism, isn't it? And we're all journalists, so I think yeah. that's the story of what's happening to Evan Gertrude could have ha actually have been any of us, couldn't it, in a different life? So mm. I think it, it, feel, it feels particularly pronounced for us, and I thought that was appalling. And yeah. just to explain to anyone at home who's wondering what our badges are, we're, we're wearing badges that say, I stand with Evan. Yeah, just a case. year, a year, yeah. Yeah. away from his family and no trouble. Trial, right? Mm. No trial, nothing. Mm. An absolute, as Jack Elsom has nailed, an absolute example of what the Putin regime is all about. Yeah. That's it. So, um, moving on yours, now. Uh, front page of the Express, Jack. Chemical attacker given asylum despite failing Christianity test. Give me your thoughts on this before I chip in. I mean, this, I mean, <laughs> this, I mean, this is just pretty extraordinary. So, obviously, the alkali attacker who um, you know chucked um, chemicals over the mother in Clapham. Uh, essentially managed to three times appeal his asylum. And the last time it was granted because he said that he converted to Christianity. He was a Muslim who came from Afghanistan, uh, but said that if he went back, he faced persecution because of his conversion. Now, the, what we learned um, last night was that the judge had seriously... Because of his conversion? Yes. Right. He said, would been persecuted. Nutty, you know, he said he would have been persecuted if he got back to Afghanistan because he'd shunned his religion. So, he's not, so the But he was shunning his religion to become a Christian to stay here? Yes. Right. Okay. So basically, he was he was sort of trying to game the system and say, "I'm now a Christian." The judge had serious <laughs> doubts about this, and he failed basic Christianity questions. He failed basic tests. He didn't really go to church um, <laughs> after he had been baptized. Um, but even though the judge had doubts about this, we learned last night is that he basically thought, "Okay, you know, because of your human rights, um, you, ha you have to be allowed to stay." And so people are getting very angry about the fact that. It appears he's tried to game the system in order to stay and used almost his. Christianity conversion as a sort of a, a guise to be able to um, uh, Say, sort of sway the judge. My own country. Exactly. Whereas actually people are saying, you know, are you actually Christian at all? Becca, I'll tell you the reason why I'm quite angry about this story. It's the fact that um, obviously, despite well, all of the, the thing we should be most angry about is obviously that these these poor people mm. were had chemicals mm. thrown over them and, and were horrifically scarred. But See, it says here, failing Christianity test. Tell me how that is more important, seemingly, than being point, a the sex offender. Thank you. Should have been how... thrown out for being a sex offender. It should throw yeah. somebody out for being a sex and offender. And also, what is a Christianity test, Nick? Exactly, I don't know. I just sit down with a, with a, a vicar and do yeah, two yeah, yeah, they actually ask questions. So, but apparently, he thought that um, Jesus was part of the Old Testament, and he thought that um, Jacob was a disciple. You know, that's some of right. the questions that they asked him. I mean, that's not what makes you a Christian, ultimately, is it? No, but... and I think you make a great point. Like, sh let's have all this energy for this man, but not about kind of did he fail or pass a Christianity test. Where is this energy for the fact that he yeah. has ruined the lives of, of mm. a woman and two children? Yeah. We know she was in, she was sedated for weeks, has lost <sighs> sight in one of her eyes. God knows what kind of trauma that those three people are going to be mm. constantly reliving. So let's have this energy for this awful man. Exactly. But they're, they're not to do with his migrant migration status. But, but, but there, is a, there is a point the which I didn't actually realise until Jack said it. So yeah. this is the beauty of these conversations, right? So there is fault. I mean, the judge, absolutely. I take your point. It's a sexual offender. It should be. But you're telling me that this guy took part in a test that doesn't really exist. I was baptized. 
because he could then stand there and go, well, I'm a Christian, if I go back to Afghanistan, that makes a mockery of the Home Office, the church, the judicial system. That's why, Rebecca, we have to have this discussion, because that is a joke. And it turned out he was a violent sex offender and a thug that threw acid at women. Yeah, I just, I just think rather than this being kind of us using this to attack the asylum system, let's use this to clean up our streets and make sure that violent sex offenders aren't on the street. I think that is that. Yeah. Is a Do you think here. the church is complicit in any of this? Well, both I, of you? I honestly couldn't give a damn yeah. whether he's Christian, Muslim, Hindi, whatever. It's the fact that he's a sex offender yeah. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. that, that is wrong. Exactly. Um, but that was, but they, they, he... they tried to deport him. That's the whole point. They tried to deport him because it he was a sex offender. Christianity. Yeah. But did he have any other right to reclaim? Because I know, obviously, with Afghanistan, you know, there are. So this was back in. He moved, ways. He, yeah, but he moved in 2018. So it's before the whole, you know, mm. this whole Taliban um, insurgents. Right. Um, they try to get rid. They try to remove foreign national offenders a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're going through the asylum process, if you then commit a sex offence, they try and deport you. So twice he was tried to be deported. Wow, On the third time, then joke, he brought yeah. the Christianity card into play, said that he converted, and so if he went back, he shouldn't have to play the card. He should have been out in his ear because of the sex. As yeah. Nick yeah. quite yeah. rightly says. Yeah, exactly. But I do or think the prison. church. I do think yeah. the church. You know, we should welcome everybody in and take some responsibility. They must have known something about this. I, but also, what kind of in, kind of impossible to gauge the um, sincerity of someone's conversion. I mean, how, how do you... I mean, it, it also kind of undermines faith, isn't it? You're not supposed to question... You know, well, we're right on it this morning, aren't we, from, from we the really get-go? Really? I think it's, a good, it's an interesting it, yeah, conversation. It is. Yeah. It is. Lots very... of opinions on that. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, good. this is a shocking, shocking thing that when I read this morning, I nearly fell off my chair. Mm. Confidence in the NHS is at an all-time low. It surprised you, did it? Yeah. I, was, I, mean... I, was, I think I was as shocked as I was that... that um, Jack Elson turned up from Barbados here to work today. <laughs> <laughs> got it in, Jay, got it in. <laughs> yes, so this is a report from the King's Fund and the Nuffield Trust on kind of our attitudes towards the NHS, and it's saying that mm. um, confidence is at a record low. It likens the public's relationship with the NHS to a toxic relationship where people just do not feel like they are getting any value out of a system which we are aware, you know, it has got huge amounts of funding. The, one of the kind of the biggest complaint being that people just cannot get face-to-face -face GP appointments for themselves or their families. Um, and it, it, and it kind of goes into the various manifestations. So also um, NHS dentists come into it. People are not thinking that if there's emergency medicine, their family members are going to get seen quickly enough. So it really speaks to a, a total crisis. And there's a bit of a social contract between the public and the NHS, isn't it? Is that, you know, we pay, you pay your taxes, but you have to then believe that at the point of emergency, at the point of care, you're going to get it. And we aren't, and it, it's breaking down. And the toxic relationship phrase, I actually think kind of works quite well, that you're kind of, there's this expectation on both sides. Mm. Um, we were talking about this upstairs at Jack obviously making the point that, you know, the NHS is not short of funding. So what we need, so clearly we need to look at how do you make sure that people feel like they're actually getting the service sure. that they, you know, that they deserve. Jack, what does the NHS look like when it is working? You know, what, what, is, a, what is a working NHS? I think you see, um, well, well, I mean, it does what it says on the tin. It is free at the point of demand. And at the moment, it is free completely, but it doesn't seem to be on demand at right. the moment. Yeah. And you end up waiting... Uh, months and months and months for basic treatment. Or you go to A&E and end up waiting 12 hours for a wait which should be, you know, an hour, half an hour. You know, and if you look at sort of this public satisfaction back in the late 1990s, it seemed to be, um, you know, massively more um, uh, praised than it is now. And it just... Can I, can I feed this whole sense? It's just not I, working. I know it's a general thing, and I know I talk about the Home Office, but, but maybe... You know, somebody came on this show some months ago and they were saying the NHS was such an incredible incarnation that almost it's spoken in, in revered terms, yeah. we can't criticise it. We have a bigger population, we have an older population, we have all sorts of financial hardships going on. Is it not the time to have a debate about the NHS 2.0? Because, I, 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 of course, you get picked up, but, but there are so many failings, and this really, to me, justifies the fact that I don't think it's fit for purpose in its present form with the changes that have taken place today. But the minute you criticise the NHS, people will go, oh, my God, oh, my God, there's mental health, there's social care, there's all sorts of things that have changed massively over the years. I think cross-party, this entire country needs to look at that and, and other things, but the NHS and go, do you know what? 
Just stop looking at it through rose-tinted glasses. It yeah. doesn't do what it was supposed to, what it set out to do, and we need to make changes to it. I don't think that's the wrong thing to say. No, at but all. I think I think oftentimes that feels like criticism of the people who work in the NHS, who yeah. I actually, you know, who we it's know. It's not a criticism. And, it's, of and the it shouldn't people. be, it but, I, but, no. I, but these, the and these are people thing. who are drawn, it's vocational, they work above and beyond to keep us safe. These were people that we sent into hospitals in plastic bags during the pandemic. Yeah. So I think there's a separation between like a system that doesn't work and the incredible people that turn up day in, day out to keep our families. But I mean, in, in criticising yeah. the very being, that is not criticising the people no, who the, keep it going. No, but yeah. I think they often, the NHS staff yeah, often I agree. are the front so line That's the revered yes. question, yes. But right? I think that it's important to say that when, it, when people say that the NHS isn't working, well, it, it actually is. Yeah. It's just that it's taking too long in order to work. But once, it, once you actually do get those appointments, once you do get the care, uh, the care is working. Completely amazing. Yeah. That's the point. When it works, I think of the old man, the old guy, I think it's amazing. What I'm trying to say is, for what it was set up to do and what it promised, the world has changed. And I don't think, Jack, Population. the NHS has been able to move with it. Yeah, and, you know, we talked about Christianity in, in, the, in the last segment. This, the NHS is probably as close as we have to a national religion at the moment yeah. in the fact that everybody loves it. However, that often means that politicians feel that they can't level any criticism towards it. I'm with that. Because I'm otherwise the voters will punish them at the ballot box. But at the moment, something has to give because we're, we're paying record taxes, putting record money into the NHS, but not getting any results from it. I'm really with Rebecca, though. It's mm. interesting to say that, you know, if we criticise the NHS, it looks like we're criticising the nurses and doctors. We're not. We're, mm. we're criticising the, the being, the body, the, the institution. It's not fair on them, right, if the, no, if the NHS has a system no. isn't working. No. 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 Right, Re moving on now, Rebecca. Uh, front page of the Mirror, this fascinating story oh as gosh. two Brits uh, have moved... Well, have, have gone over to Russia to fight... Uh, with them. Yes, it's absolutely astounding. So the so the Mirror have kind of identified these two blokes, Ben Stimson and Aidan Minnis, who have gone over to f fight for Putin. Um, they're both really nice guys. One of them um, was a former member of the National Front. Right. Oh, um, I thought I'm good. I'm glad you were a bit... I'm, I'm getting a bit old. I have to be led down a garden path. I was, was going to go, what do you mean, <laughs> nice guys, woman? <laughs> no, no, no. It was a, it was a, a definite, little bit of tongue-in-cheek. I yeah. was trying my tongue-in-cheek, exactly. Um, it's, what I actually think is astounding about this is how they managed to get there, because both blokes were um, being monitored. They were uh, both arrested under the terrorism attack, so um, act rather. So how they were able to get to Russia to join Putin's front line, um, I think kind of beggars belief. And we're sort of talking a bit, aren't we, about kind of the systems and how we keep people safe and how do we know who is where? Um, and clearly, you know, there are creaks and gaps in the system because the fact that these blokes have been able to go and join Putin, they post these videos on social media, kind of taunting the Ukrainians. They make jokes about British taxpayers' money, um, you know, as they come across Ukraine. Ukrainian shells. I mean, they really are nasty pieces of work. And the idea that there are people in this country who sympathise with Putin... Colonel Richard is Kemp, who's, who's a regular on this show, says that if they ever set foot in this country again, they should be arrested and held... And they, and they would be, which is... Reason. Yeah, and they should be. But, Jack, are they going to be made stateless? Like Shakira mm. Begum was. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, presumably, the Russians would sort of take them in if they're fighting for them. You know, they're coming back with again, yeah. again, another pair of useful idiots who... Um, you know, who, who has Richard Kemp said a complete disgrace. I mean, the, I've seen that in the, in the Mirror article, the Home Office says that anyone who travels to a conflict zone to engage in unlawful activity should be expected to be investigated on their return. And I think that maybe people agree with Richard mm. Kemp that rather than being investigated, they should be yeah. thrown in prison immediately. But is it different if they move, if somebody goes to fight for an ally? Of the UK is it illegal on one side but not another? And who's setting those rules? I don't. Understand. I, I, I don't know. Obviously, you have mm. you have legal wars and you have illegal wars, and you know this is judged in the eyes of the UN to be an illegal conflict. And I so, see. if you're going over there, you know, obviously, he has had many allegations uh, that Vladimir Putin committing war crimes in Ukraine. Yeah. So, if you are trying to aid that type of regime, then and I then think try and, and post harsher. stuff saying the British taxpayer didn't yeah. favour, yeah. um, they shouldn't be allowed back. Uh, yeah. Listen, amazing! What an absolute start that was. <laughs> Thank you Thank both. You. Ooh, yeah. Oh, Jack Ellison's <laughs> well, on it today. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be back in just under an hour after a kip and a croissant. <laughs> well, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions this morning. Uh, we were talking about Tory MPs quitting, aren't we? Which seems like something we talk about almost every week, Jeremy Kyle. Stop saying it with a spring in your step. Um, he has it at a jaunty we're, angle. We're asking you the evergreen question. <laughs> evergreen. Uh, is the Tory party facing wipeout at the general election? Woody says uh, more Toy Story. Toy Story. <laughs> More Toy Stories leave the Tory party. More Tory MPs leave the Tory. Because That's because he's called Woody. Oh, my God. Stay there. Woody, who's not in Toy Story, says, More Tory MPs leave the Conservative Party like rats uh, leaving a sinking ship. Uh, Carpal Thorpe, back to you. Oh, that was a broadcasting highlight of mine. Uh, Leslie not says, mine. I've <laughs> voted Tory all my life. 
but not next time. The last straw was a pathetic attempt to bribe people with a national insurance cut. Uh, Ian, we've had it as a country. The Tories have been abysmal, but Labour will it be even worse. This is what I worry about. This and is people's... Oh. Maeve says the Tories are indeed facing a wipeout come the general election, but how many will join reform, making reform just as bad as the rest? Talk today at talk.tv, text to 8722. Please do start your message with the word talk. What are we? 6.38 uh, Wednesday morning, Corporal Thorpe. Well, moving on now, and there are widespread security worries over online Chinese merchandising giant Timu, which is offering money to entice customers to sign up to a membership. Now, in exchange for cash and store credit, shoppers are required to give the brand's permission to use their likeness and biographical information. It comes, of course, amid warnings this week about Chinese cyber security threats. Well, joining us now is The Sun's technology and science reporter, Millie Taylor. Millie, you've been looking into this for us. Can you just explain the basics of the story? So, essentially, consumers are being uh, lured into kind of giving away a lot of their personal data. So, like you said, their likeness, their biographical data. So, not just geographical data, biographical data. What does that include? So, it's, it's vague, and I think vague intentionally right. um, so this can include your name so your likeness your appearance it says photo as well uh, your opinions your statements um, your likeness wow. what makes you you essentially um, and the reason why this is concerning is is obviously like you said the uh, the the nature of um, Hacking and mm. and artificial intelligence, where it is today, the sophistication of artificial intelligence as it stands right now is is kind of opens the door for the, the, this likeness to be used as deep fakes. So, so just you. just for people, because we were talking about it all week, and and this Chinese, um, you know, the, the the deputy prime minister stood up on Tuesday and said, you know, basically, forty million people had their their, their electoral information hacked in twenty twenty one. A lot of people have been saying for a long time that the Chinese are, are really behind all of this, and it seems mm -hmm. that the world is perhaps waking up to what's going on, Millie. Um, to what extent is Timu potentially linked to the Chinese government? And what, what, what should people fear? I think that's probably a good mm. question. Although I so, it. the extent to which Timu is linked with the Chinese government is not well known. Um, so, as, as what they have publicly said is that they are not affiliated with the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, what we do know is that... Beijing have a lot of power over the, the companies in their home nest. Yeah. So it, the extent to which that data is um, completely safe under Timu's wings is, is yet to be seen. Um, Do you think that the reaction in the last few days to people in this country, um, officials in this country and, and other countries as well about China is... is is well placed because a lot of people are going. Oh, you're panicking, but there's so many examples that this is beginning. It's cyber, cyber security, right? One hundred percent. And and the UK government has kind of pointed their fingers at China in the last few days um, and has named China as the uh, country behind a really wide scale electoral commission attack, mm -hmm. um, where they accessed around. 40 million uh, voters' personal details. Um, so if they're doing that, then it's, it wouldn't be so much of a leap to assume that they would yeah. be able to access. There's a lack of confidence there that our 100%. data is being handled correctly. Mm. Um, also, we've we found this with, with other companies that um, sometimes they might use products that are from dubious factory uh, environments, mm. perhaps slave labour being involved as well. So is there perhaps an ethical... Uh, question mark over the way that Team U operates. I asked that as a previous Team U customer. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I ordered. No. I ordered quite a bit from them a couple of weeks ago because I, I didn't. Did you know about this at the time? No, of course it, not. This is a really interesting point. Would it change the way you do this, having heard this? Well, it, like in a way, I, do you know what they said? They had a three-month return policy, and I thought, well, that sounds fantastic. I can return. You know, it takes three I months for me to send something back. I saw the thing about fifty quid. I saw it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Genuinely, Team U is is incredibly, incredibly enticing to consumers, particularly in in the state our country is in right now with yeah. the cost of living crisis. It is incredibly. No money up front. Take three months, all that. Exactly, and you, you can get 
hordes of stuff for yeah. really not that much money. They sell everything. And I'm not everything. saying that to advertise. I just mean, like, I was, I guess I, I had a bit of a question mark of like, Speed oh, though. how, well, we can see. Yeah. Um, how ethical is a company, I guess, that covers such a mm. wide well, variety exactly. you went of and, products? So, what I'm saying is you went and did it. And of course, it, 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 you, yeah. I, think, I think Millie makes a great point. In the middle of a cost of living crisis where people are really, really struggling, if you're, if you're faced with, do you know what? You can do this, no money for three months, we won't check. What I want to say is that I want to ask you because you're the expert. There was a lot of there was a lot of backlash to what the government said. It was taken you three years to respond to this government. And all you've done is sanction two companies and one person, or one person and two companies. So what we've been told, which is why we wanted you on today, really, is is that we have to be vigilant. That we as individuals need to to watch out for these potential scams. Give us some general advice. A voice, not just advice. Timu. What 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 should people be aware of? So. Obviously, when anybody kind of signs up to an app or, or anything, you get the T's and C's right in front of you. And I'm guilty of it. We all are. Scroll along, click accept, and you don't read into the fine print. Mm. Um, fortunately, what people have been doing on social media, alongside of the, wow, glitz and glam, look, I'm getting all this money from Timu, I'm getting such a great deal. Mm. Fortunately, there are a few consumers who are reading the fine print. And what they're sharing is what we spoke about earlier. And looking at the fine print and where it says that you agree to surrender your likeness, your name, photo, opinion, statements. Opinions. Wild stuff. That's scary. Wild stuff. Very scary indeed. But we do have a right of reply from TMU, um, and they say that TMU gathers user information solely for the purpose of delivering our service and to enhance customer experience. We do not sell user information. Terms and conditions highlighted are commonplace in similar promotions held by various companies across different sectors. I've but never I believe... heard about likeness and stuff. I've like never that. heard about sharing your opinions. But um, no. Millie is going to be. God, they're not going to want you as a client, are they? They're going to throw you right out. You're hey, not going to pass I get test. paid for my opinions right here, Jeremy. Millie, Kyle. thank you. And I mean that. It's a really, thank really you. interesting subject. And I I think on the back of what we've been talking about, I think uh, people should be just aware, would you say? Definitely. And you're going to be continuing to investigate this story yeah. for The Sun, aren't you? Wow. Well, I look Fantastic. forward to getting an update on that. Thank Thanks, you Millie. for joining us, Millie Taylor from The Sun there. Well, still to come, Kinsey joins us live from LA Hurrah. with all the latest royal news. Kinsey, what have you got for us? Thank you, Nick. Yeah, that's right. Prince Harry has found himself thrust into the Sean P. Diddy Combs scandal with such serious allegations being le leveled at the rapper. Will this hurt Harry's reputation? Plus, an Easter celebration to remember. I'll have all that and more coming up. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. 
Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back. You were talk today. It's approaching 11 minutes to 7 o'clock Wednesday morning. Now, King Charles, hurrah, will attend Windsor's Easter church service after worries that his ongoing treatment for cancer would prevent him. Good news. Well, doctors have reportedly advised the king to reduce his workload and avoid the risks associated with larger crowds. The royal guest list for the service will therefore be considerably smaller, dubbed Easter light. Well, we're joined now by royal commentator and host of To Die For Daily podcast, Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, good morning. Now, people will be very pleased to see the King out and about on Sunday, won't they? I absolutely agree with you. I think this is the best news. You know, Peter Phillips told uh, Sky Australia over the weekend that the King was very frustrated uh, that the treatment was taking so long because he was so eager to get back to work and to be the face of the royal family and and to give, I believe, um, you know, everyone comfort in this time where we're all really concerned about the royal family and their health scares. So it will bring a lot of smiles across people's faces to see the King out and about uh, pictures of him at on Easter with multiple members of the family. It is being dubbed Easter light. We won't see the Prince and Princess of Wales, um, but so much excitement around the return of the King. Um, I I'm just going to cut in for a minute. Um, I just want to say um, it's 10 to midnight, isn't it, in Los Angeles? It is, yes. In 10 minutes' time, happy birthday, Princess. <laughs> thank, thank you. It's hard sharing a birthday with Mariah Carey and Fergie, so okay. I really appreciate oh, that. Yeah. Oh, that's depressing. <laughs> but happy birthday. Listen, 21 happy again. Birthday, and and you have been the most wonderful person throughout the last couple of years. We loved having you on. But happy birthday, Kinsey Scove. I had to jump it in. It is her birthday here, by the it way, is, yeah, so we can say happy birthday to you. She's in the land of Thanks. sunshine and, <laughs> and fake teeth in L.A., where, where it is 10 to 11. How, how are you celebrating your birthday? Doing 100 interviews? about the royal family, probably. <laughs> I'm going whale watching. I love whale watching. That is my... That's what I do on my downtime. That's amazing. Royal watcher <laughs> and whale watcher. Sorry, um, not <laughs> whales watching. Did you get that? Very good. Oh, Prince nice. Of whales and whale You're watching. literally going whale watching. That's why they pay you the big bucks. Yes, I love <laughs> whale watching and dolphins. There's sea lions everywhere. I, it's a thrill. Good. Well, it's send amazing. us some pictures. Sorry, I know this is slightly off track. This is brilliant. <laughs> Whale watching. I love it. Brilliant. Happy birthday, sweetheart. Fabulous. Who else Thank are we you. expecting to see at the Easter service, Kinsey? Do we think Prince Andrew's going to make another oh, sort of surely soft not. public appearance? Well, he was there last year, is that correct? Well, we saw him at Sandringham for Christmas, remember? Yeah. I think that that's um, a very... I think that that's... A, a likelihood. You know, another thing we're seeing circulating is that um, Princess Beatrice might be thrust back into the limelight a little bit to support the royal family. I'm not too sure if that's the case, though, with two scripted dramas on the horizon about Andrew's relationship with Epstein. And if if they stick to the story, Princess Beatrice was right there in the room and, uh, you know, experienced that that interview live. I, I'm, I'm going to throw... It's not um, it's something I've heard. I'm not sure if it's true. Eugene is quite close to Harry and Meghan, isn't he? Isn't she? Yeah. And yeah, actually, she the, does, sisters, she has... the sisters are quite split, aren't they? Because you, it, this one that you've just said, uh, Beatrice, uh, is closer to William and Kate. You wonder whether the games are going to continue and the thing will be fractured even further down the middle. Well, there were rumours for a while that Eugenie might be looking at a place to live in the States. True. And, you know, she was at the Super Bowl with Prince Harry one year. So, yes, very close still. Interesting. We might as well talk about Harry. Um, uh, a front page of The Sun today. Lawsuit links Duke with rapper. This is the story that... Can I can't say his name. Is it Combs or Coombs? 
It's P uh, Sean P. Diddy Combs. Can you tell us what these allegations are? We saw pictures in the UK, I think yesterday, wasn't it, of his mansions in wherever being ransacked Raven. by the FBI. This morning, we, he's a sex trafficking case. Yeah, I just want to stress, and I've seen I've seen um, a lot of the comparisons to Epstein and Andrew. This is not the case. There is no proof that Prince Harry nurtured any type of relationship with Sean P. Diddy Combs. His name is mentioned in a $30 million lawsuit, I believe, by the accuser to elevate the status of this lawsuit. You know, he's trying to, within the pages of, of the lawsuit, prove Prince Harry's power. P. Diddy's power by association with Prince Harry, but th these photos are from 2007. In a, a two, 2011 interview with Graham Norton, Diddy, you know, jokes about Harry, and it's clear that these two don't have a relationship with each other. So I just think that this is the accuser trying to garner more attention for this um, lawsuit and trying to legitimize his lawsuit a little bit more by adding the glitz and glamour of, of throwing Prince Harry under the bus. And you know, I, I I'm going to get in trouble for saying that Prince Harry. People, you know, people are going to be mad at me for for giving him the benefit of the doubt here. But I think this is a nothing burger. Yeah, and interesting. And actually, that photo that was on screen there with with Harry uh, and Kanye and P Diddy, I believe that's Prince William in the background. You know, Prince William was yeah. at that event. Um, it that's just seems really been said. It's yeah, been said. well, he, yeah, he was there. So it just seems odd to kind of yeah. I think that's well, William, I, I, William I, on the I left think, hand side. I think there, the most in the interesting comment is what Kinsey said. This is patently the accuser trying to blow up the importance of their law suit. But let's not oversimplify that this is another very, very famous rapper or person from the United States facing potentially... Well, exactly. It's like what we were talking about earlier. I wish the focus here was on sex somebody trafficking. who's... Yeah, on, on somebody who's been accused of sex crimes rather than, you know, it conveniently being used as, uh, you know, against somebody else, in this case, Prince Harry. Um, um, there are rumours... We spoke about Beatrice earlier. Um, there are rumours, Kinsey, that she might actually become a working royal, not just that she will step up her duty, but actually yeah. officially become a working member of the royal family. Yeah, and I, I just um, don't see that happening with the associ association of Prince Andrew and the Duchess of York. I, I'm Honestly, I, I hate to say it, but I feel like uh, we automatically associate her with her mother and mm. father who... I don't have, you know, the cleanest of resumes when it comes to being... But it's quite interesting, the old... Kins, it's quite interesting, the old rehabilitation thing. Many people have said to me over the years that Prince Charles is actually terrible at confrontation. And the fact that he's, you know... <laughs> his dreadful brother, dishonourable brother, was able to lead the family or be there at Sandringham. Fergie, who I happen to like, by the way, but but there you go. Uh, she seems to be back in the fall. It wouldn't surprise me, but it's all about context, really. And it, it always amazes me that we're talking about a slimmed-down mon monarchy and then you've got these, these people still getting air miles. But listen, happy birthday, Kinsey! Thank you. Thank you very Five much. Five minutes to go. I love and the both of you. <laughs> whale watching. I hope you have an amazing time. I'm very jealous. Are you? Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to go whale watching. There's a line there and I'll just get a punch in the face. Yes, he will, as he deserves. Thank you so much, happy Kinsey, birthday, and happy sweetheart. birthday for four minutes' time. Well, lots more still to come on Talk Today. MPs might be on recess, but they haven't gone quietly. Whale watching. The Prime Minister was forced into a mini shuffle yesterday after two of his ministers resigned. But will they be the last? Do please stay with us. It's almost seven o'clock. We're going whale watching. We'll see you in three. <laughs>Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, we're absolutely. Supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It is 7 a.m. on Wednesday, the 27th of March. Sure is, my friends. You were talk today on TV, radio, online, and your smart speaker. And these are Wednesday morning's top stories. Continued ter Tory turmoil. You try saying that. A Tory to the double resignation <laughs> forces Rishi Sunak into a mini reshuffle as Education Minister Robert Halfen and Arms Armed Forces Minister James Heapy both quit their posts. More time behind bars. Russia extends the detention of journalist Evan Gershevitz, meaning he will remain in jail until June as this poor man awaits a trial. We will speak this hour to one of Evan's colleagues. And heartbreak for the Dragons. Wales miss out on Euro 2024 qualification in a nail-biting penalty shootout. Talk Sports, Shabana Hearn shares her reaction this hour. <clears throat> And there will be sunshine out there today, but there will also be some pretty hefty showers, spells of rain and some hill snow. I'll have all the details in the forecast a bit later. Give me sunshine, give me rain, give me Emily Rose Adams, who's not a pain. Good morning. <laughs> that was rubbish. Well, thanks, Jeremy. Good morning. Now, the search for six missing people following the bridge disaster in Baltimore has come to an end as rescuers say they're now presumed dead. The Coast Guard says it suspended its recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. Several vehicles were on the bridge at the time it fell into the river. And officials have since revealed that the vessel suffered power problems before it issued a distress call moments before the crash. Back here and there are concerns of a continuing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers announced their departure from the party. Robert Halfen became the 63rd politician to say he will not stand in the next election. And he was joined by the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who also resigned. Well, it triggered a mini reshuffle for Rishi Sunak and former Labour Special Advisor Paul Richards has told Talk Today this trend is bound to continue. Nothing to be more MPs going out because uh, why would you hang in there? It's really interesting there because, of course, you know, normally they're desperate to be ministers. Mm -hmm. They're desperate to climb that greasy pole and all of that. And now they're just jumping off it as fast as they can. Previously unseen pictures of the Clapham acid attacker getting baptised have emerged as new documents reveal the church that carried it out knew about his criminal past. The Grange Road Baptist Church limited Abdul Azadi's rights to attend services after a sexual assault conviction but then supported his claim to stay in Britain.
First-time buyers are being offered the chance to get onto the property ladder with a £5,000 deposit. Yorkshire Building Society says its deal could allow people to borrow up to 99% of a property value. But it's not available for flats or new-build properties and potential borrowers must pass strict affordability and credit scoring checks. And Wales manager Rob Page says football's a cruel game after they missed out on a place at Euro 2024. Daniel James failed to secure the vital spot kick as they lost their playoff final against Poland in a penalty shootout. Lawless following extra time. Be gutted for them. Yeah, it's a it is a horrible way to go out, isn't it? And uh, and it is a cruel game. So um, really disappointed right now, but really proud of the players. And that was a message to them in the changing room after. You know, for what the campaign overall, I couldn't be more proud. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Can I just tell you how professional this lady is? Because things are happening in this studio. I think we've been hacked. It's because we've been talking about hackers quite a lot this week. And I reckon I was that we're suddenly Mike Graham. You were then Keith 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 Lemon. And then Perfect. and you kept going like a, a, a professional. If anyone at home, well no, anyone who is listening at home, um, the background of the studio for some reason keeps it's flickering changing. and changing colours. There's some grenons in the system. Maybe that's that do a ghost. Stick with us. Could be my mother who died, of course. She's probably telling me the show. Is rubbish. And oh my on. goodness. But anyway, there we go. Oh, oh no! Yeah. Oh god, if you just tuned in. Oh! We're just just to confirm, we are not in control of this. Mummy, don't do this to me. <laughs> Stop it, mother. Oh I promise god. you I'm bathing myself. It's just her next to me. She gets the worst. Well, we're gonna try and push on despite being haunted in the studio. If you're listening on the radio, my God, this is no good. Social media, let's get to it. Yes, right. <laughs> Emily, thank you so much. Well, moving on to our... No, we're not going to move on no. to our top story. We're going to discuss some emails. Um, you've been getting in touch all morning um, because more Tory MPs are to quit in the run-up to the... Oh, it's happening again. Look, oh, God, there we go. What is going <laughs> on? Uh, yes, more Tory MPs are to quit in the run-up to the general election. Do you think that the Conservative Party are facing... A complete wipeout. Orla says the Tories must go. We were subjected to their years of horrible administration, especially their ridiculously abhorrent immigration policy. Nora, I really hope for a Tory wipeout in the elections. They've done enough damage already. And Gareth says it's already game over for the Tories. What, what's more concerning is what they're going to do or not do in their remaining time in office. Can, I also, can I also say that, that we threw out as well, they're about to go on a recess. We lost two government ministers. The world's almost at war. Financially, we're all messed up. And we did throw out, um, is it OK for MPs to go on a three-week recess? And I just think the apathy in British politics is best summed up by Will, who says, I'm actually OK with them having a, a holiday because they can't do as much harm as when Parliament is sitting, <laughs> which I think is quite interesting. What are your thoughts? Talk today at Talk TV. Uh, just get on. I've lost my... uh, uh, it's yeah. Talk today at talk.tv. You're glitching now. <laughs> Someone hacked you. Uh, oh, you can text talk plus your message to 8722. Well, we're going to try to move on to our top story it's that now. It's witch Fitzgerald. She's doing Hopefully this. Hopefully without any... No! No, it's happened again. It's it. It keeps this is happening. Brilliant, man. Well, there is fresh <laughs> chaos for the Tory party, as well as us, as yes. two more MPs quit, forcing Rishi Sunak to organise a mini reshuffle. Well, James Heapy has been replaced <laughs> by Leo Doherty as Armed Forces Minister, and in a change to the Education Minister role, Robert Halfen has stepped aside and been replaced by Luke Hall. I've got to hand it to you, Corporal Thought. You are cool. Talk to these political correspondents. The excellent Alyssa Fitzgerald is back with us. <laughs> Uh, we're also joined by Chief Political Correspondent for The Times, Aubrey Allegretti, and a ghost called Mary, who's just made it into the studio. It's weird, you two, isn't it? I mean, if you're listening on the radio, it's a bit difficult, but it keeps flashing up different colours. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite dull. Oh, there it's, we go. Uh... Yeah, so it's just kind of switching the, the it's screens. Fine. We'll, we'll just embrace it as part of, yeah. I think it's quite, it kind of, we could use it as a metaphor of what's happening in the Tory party. Absolutely. Maybe the lights that... are about to go off here. I don't know, the whole thing's but going Maybe, on, really. maybe, we'll wait and see. Um, but yeah, maybe that's good timing. We've had more Tory chaos yeah. yesterday. I mean, obviously, and, and we've got to reiterate this, this does happen before a general election. There's always people who do resign. 63, though? But that's the key thing here. There is, there's a lot of Conservative MPs who've decided not to stand at the next election. Both of these MPs who stood down yesterday were very kind of respectful in their resignations. They didn't say it was because of anything particular wrong in the Conservative Party. They weren't kind of, there weren't any digs or anything particularly kind of... Although he'd be calling for more, more, more expenditure on defence. Sure. 
Wow. Go, it's this going, is it's weird. going. <laughs> uh, Aubrey, do you think this could be good news for the Tory party, uh, beyond the election, I mean, in the sense that with so many people quitting, it means that a fresh batch of new people will come in with new ideas. Will this mean a rebranded Tory party rather than more of the same? Good question. It's going to look very different. And actually, one of the most interesting things that's going on in the background is you're seeing Conservative MPs that are staying in Parliament anticipating that Rishi Sunak might lose the next general election and turning their attention to the leadership contest that would follow. And so there's a huge amount of sort of work being done under the surface to uh, build rapport with and relationships with the new MPs that are going to come into Parliament. They are the ones that are currently being sort of fought for so that after the general election, when there's a leadership contest, people are already... I think it's, I think it's a really, really interesting point because um, if you look across Europe, I said this last week, if you look across Europe, the, 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 the rise of those sort of... I can't keep the straight face. That sort of right-wing group, if you like, parties in, in all sorts of countries. And many people who are true Conservatives, gang, would say this Tory party is not... Wow. This is not a traditional Tory party. High taxation, the military, uh, uh, policemen and women on the streets. I believe that what will come from what we all believe will probably be a, a, a Labour victory, but we could be wrong. We have to be open-minded. Will they reincarnate the, the Tory party? And I think you're right. I think people who don't want to be part of that or perceive to be part of the past will go and it will change. I think that will definitely happen, don't you? There will be a reset. Yeah. I suppose the question is, basically, which wing of the party ends up stronger after yeah, the next election good point. and is able to, if you like, kind of capture the leadership. And there's questions about whether or not you potentially have a, a caretaker leader, so somebody who kind of steadies the ship horse. for a little bit, or, you know, somebody who really, uh, you know, wants to sort of take the party back into government. But you've got all sorts of candidates vying behind the scenes, people like Cammy Badnock, people like Grant Shapps, uh, James Cleverley is a sort of dark horse. People don't talk about him as much, but he probably would be somebody who would go for it in the future as well. So all of that kind of manoeuvring and anticipation is already happening now. And Alicia, talk to me about Jonathan Gullis, because he's been appointed the new deputy, or a new deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. Uh, do you think that he was the obvious person to put in place to replace Lee Anderson? Well, I mean, I guess there's two arguments you could have about that. On the one hand, you could very much say, yes, he's in, from a similar wing of the party to Lee Anderson. He's, he's towards the right of the party, Has quite believes in quite similar things to Lee Anderson. Lots he's a of cheerleader, isn't he? He's a fighter, he's very, JG. He's certainly very vocal. Very yeah. vocal in a similar way that, that, that Lee was, I guess. And they're both kind of often caught up in some kind of newspaper headline for yeah. saying something that doesn't quite align with what Rishi Sunak said. So in that sense, yes, but then you could probably also say... That's probably a strange choice because part of the reason that Lee Anderson had to leave that role was because of doing that. Yeah. So they've kind of replaced him with a candidate who's pretty similar. Listen, but I like Gullis, but it's another but example, isn't it? The same of mistake. Soon... Yeah, that's yeah. a really good question. Is it, is it just Sunak going, oh, I tell you what, I'm worried about the Red Bull. Let's get, you know, somebody who knows quite vocal from Stoke. And I'm worried about Cornwall. So let's get a tin miner who doesn't know. It's all a bit like haphazard to me. That's what I think. I guess also what the Prime Minister keeps trying to do is balance between those on the right of the party and those towards the centre of, uh, of the political spectrum. He's you trying wanted to kind the job, of pal. Good make luck. that balance and trying to make sure that he equally represents people from all wings of the party. So I guess that's probably what he's trying to do with that appointment. Aubrey, can I pick you up on something? Um, yesterday, you, you tweeted, this is interesting, that Gaza vote, Gaza vote um, some weeks ago, and Starmer allegedly, we make the point, putting pressure on the Speaker, Lindsay Hall, to ignore the SNP and all that sort of stuff. Tell us what you were talking about yesterday, because this is... Um, Parliament may be bringing Sakir Starmer to task. Yes, and so effectively, in the weeks after the Gaza vote, there have been concerted efforts by Conservative MPs, including people in the Cabinet, to try and make Keir Starmer account for whatever conversations happened between him and the Commons Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle. Um, I believe that the Commons leader, Penny Morden, is very sympathetic to some sort of formal investigation. The interesting aspect to all this as well is that it would kind of drag in the Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, as well. So it's not just a sort of political point about Keir Starmer. It does potentially raise the prospects of the government moving very slowly against the Commons Speaker as well. So there are 58 MPs who've signed this new motion, if you like, which calls for an investigation by the Privileges that Committee. Does that have to be a number to, for it to go through? or is it Not necessarily. They're trying to actually kind of use a different process for initiating one of these investigations. Normally it's up to the Speaker to decide whether to allow an investigation. In this case, obviously, he was intimately involved, so they got his three deputies to adjudicate. They said no, so they're trying this different mechanism instead, 
which we might hear more about in the next few days. And Alicia, um, Grant Shapps has heaped more pressure on Rishi Sunak to commit mm. to spending, uh, well, greater spending of GP, GDP, sorry, on the defence budget. Is that the sign of a cohesive cabinet, though, for him to be <laughs> talking to newspapers, speaking publicly about the demands on Rishi Sunak? Can't I you just reach a, across the I th table? I think I think it's a leadership pitch, isn't it? Well, well, I mean, you could say that, but also this definitely isn't the first time that someone quite senior in cabinet has pretty much briefed against what the prime minister has chosen to do. And this this issue with defence spending is is a difficult one because obviously, if you look across the globe, you could say. Now, now or never, really. I mean, when, when would you need defence spending more than, than, than at the moment? But then on a political run, it's not really a vote winner. So leading up to an election, lots of people... Don't look at me like that. Hear me out. Hear I me think out. it would be... No, no, I would, I would say it would be a traditional Tory voter winner. That's what I would say. Maybe, but I think when you're looking at it in the broader picture, I think maybe yeah. in a normal general yeah. election, yeah. but at Point the taken. moment, probably not. So I don't think lots of people are going to say, oh, brilliant, the cost of living crisis is really bad. You know, all of this is really wrong, but they're going to spend an extra 0.5% of GDP on, on defence. That's probably not going to swing people's vote. I think it's really interesting. I don't know what Nick thinks, all of you, actually. Um, there's, a, there's always a moment when a parliament's ending mm. and a prime minister's tenure is ending and all the polls would point to that. We can't say it's going to happen. You watch all these individuals, the Shaps, the Cleverleys, whatever, they start to unsubtly not toe the party line. Because if they think he's going down, mate, they will absolutely... I'm now Mike Graham. They will absolutely throw him aside. And I think the next few months will be quite interesting. It happens to every single leader, because they're trying to work out now who they should get close to, who might get the job, what the future brings. That's what happens. It's a dirty old job, isn't it, politics? Yeah, sometimes MPs really do see the whites on the wall and they want to be sort of in the right position. They want to say after the general election, look, I warned that this was going mm. to happen. Mm. Um, although I suppose during the heat of the election campaign itself, you do see people sort of retreat into their trenches. So for those final six weeks, I imagine we'll see everybody very on message. But in the sort of longer campaign, I think you're absolutely right, people will be positioning for after a future leadership contest. Very interesting indeed. Well, thank you to Alicia Fitzgerald and Aubrey Allegretti from The Times. <laughs> In the rave that yes. is this room. <laughs> it's like it's apologies, like rave, yeah. apologies for the flashing background there. Well, let's take another look at some of this morning's front pages now. The Mail focuses on the Clapham acid attacker who claimed he was a devoted Christian in order to win asylum. Well, Abdul Azidi, a convicted sex offender, failed the religious test but was allowed to stay in the UK. There's a lot more to that story. We'll talk about it. The Times says only one in four people, this is a shock to me, believe the NHS is working. A satisfaction in the health service falls to an all-time low. And heartbreak bridge, cry the Metro, as rescuers searched for survivors affected by Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge, which collapsed after a container ship veered off course. Right, 7.15, Wednesday morning. We're live across the UK and to Russia now, and the country has extended the detention of our colleague, jailed Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershowitz, in a move the US has slammed as using Americans to achieve political ends. Well, the 32-year-old journalist who had lived in the country for many years is accused by Russia of espionage, something that he flatly denies. Well, Anne Simmons is the Moscow bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal and, as a colleague of Evan, has been following this story very closely. Um, Anne, thank you first up for joining us. Russia has consistently said that Evan had classified information. That was their reason for imprisoning a, an innocent man. But we've heard no detail about trial. It will be a year tomorrow, or a year... It's a year since this poor man was jailed. We're all here in support of him wearing badges, standing with Evan. Tell us the latest, if you can, Anne. Yes, certainly. I mean, as you mentioned, actually Friday will mark one year since our colleague uh, Evan Gershtovich uh, was detained by uh, Russian authorities. Uh, he was in the Ural city of Yekaterinburg reporting. He was on a reporting assignment. Uh, he was also an accredited journalist, meaning that the Russian foreign ministry had given him permission to report in the country. And, and of course, within the law, and that is exactly what Evan was doing. Um, this week, in fact, yesterday, uh, authorities, a uh, Russian court, extended his detention by another three months. That basically means that Evan will be, will have been in, uh, detained in prison for more than a year. Um, his detention has been uh, extended until June 30th. Uh, his original pre-trial detention was meant to end last May of 2023, May 29th. 
So Evan um, has been, again, to repeat, in jail on charges, on a charge of espionage, which, of course, the Wall Street Journal, Evan, and the US government strongly denies. And Anne, what are the US government doing about his detention? What is the latest? Well, Evan has been designated as being wrongfully detained by the US government. And that essentially means that uh, uh, the US government will unlock a, a raft of resources in order to secure his freedom. And I should also add that of Paul Whelan, um, a, a former Marine, also now serving uh, prison time on an espionage charge. He has been in jail for five years. Um, he is also designated as being wrongfully detained. The US government has said in the case of both of these men that they are pulling out all the stops, that they are working 24 hours a day to try and secure their release. They say they are, you know, in, in conversations with the Russian government, with Russian authorities, and that they won't stop until both of these men come home. And I wouldn't believe a word that came out of Vladimir Putin's mouth, but in that toe-curling interview with Tucker Carlson, um, he implied that Russian and US security services are in contact about a deal that could prove hopeful for Evan and uh, that other prisoner. Difficult for everybody because you go, well, why would I do a deal with somebody? But, but his family and I guess him? I mean, how is he? What are the conditions? Do we have any sort of information for people to understand what he's going through at the moment, apart from psychologically. What about on a daily basis, Anne? What, what I can tell you is that he's being held in a Stalin-era prison. So that alone tells you that the conditions aren't going to be great. Um, what we have reported is that uh, Evan uh, is able to have an hour of exercise a day. So he's basically uh, in, in detention for 11 hours a day. We've also reported that uh, he is allowed to get reading material. So he's been reading extensively uh, all kinds of literature. He is allowed to receive letters. And many people from across the world have actually sent letters to Evan, basically uh, giving him their support. Um, it, it, it's undoubtedly very difficult. He's incarcerated. He does not have his freedom. The US government, and in particular the US ambassador to Russia, Lynn Tracy, has visited Evan on several occasions and actually said that he remains resilient and really strong and, and really upbeat given the circumstances. And uh, she, of course, has said, and the US government has said that he is a pawn right now, uh, a political pawn, and uh, the US government has demanded his immediate re release as has the Wall Street Journal. And Anne, what do you think that the global support means to Evan mm. and his family? Do you think it's going to boost their morale in a, what must be a very, very, very difficult time? Oh, it definitely does. Um, we, we know for sure that uh, the letters that Evan re has received, he has tried to respond to every single one. Um, he has said, and we have reported this, that, uh, you know, he is just so uh, so chuffed by the fact that, <laughs> that there's been this outpouring of support. And his family remains optimistic. And they have said publicly that uh, it can only be optimism for them, because if they turn to pessimism, that means that they've given up. So there is definitely Anne Simmons from the Wall Street Journal, thank you so much indeed. And, I, and I'm glad there is an outpouring uh, globally. I think he's an innocent man. I think he's a political pawn. And we uh, all here stand with him. And thank you very much indeed for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you, Anne. Well, still to come on Talk Today, failings within the border force have allowed high-risk flights to land in Britain. And we'll tell you about the rescued hedgehog, which turned out to be a bobble hat. Well, the sun. It's one of my favourite stories, Jeremy. Just, <coughs> okay. just trust me on this one. The Sun's Jack Elson and the news movement's Rebecca Hudson are here to look through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today. It is still happening. It's a rave. It's a rave. It's 7:21. The lights keep changing. We're a dance, and see you soon. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> even, <laughs> for, yeah. minute, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Talk today at 7.25 in the morning. We'll have the weather in just a mini-mo gym jam, but here's what else is coming up on today's programme. Now, it's something we've been calling for on Talk TV. The BBC will introduce a means-tested licence fee for the first time, with poorer households paying less. We'll be discussing that in the papers next. At 7.45, our intrepid reporter Nick Ellaby brings us Labour's plan for more wind farms off Britain's coast. But I want him to hold on to one. We'll see. Well, the Premier League of Shame has been released, detailing football's worst behaved fans. Shaban has the latest at 10 to 8. But there's only one woman you want to hear of at 7.25. It's the First Lady of Weather. Nazanin Gaffer, good morning. I'm really confused. I'm worried that my weather graphics are just going to be for the overnight Listen, if you start well. doing, for people listening to the radio, we've got a site technically. If you start doing the weather and you get Keith Lemons chops, you've got it behind <laughs> Keith Lemons come up. Oh, my God! My mother is at large. Crack on. This is going to be interesting. Uh, let's take a look at the weather, hopefully. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. An unsettled picture continues for the rest of this week. It's because low pressure still dominates the scene out in the Atlantic. It's throwing through lots of fronts of spells of rain, showers, even some hill snow out there for today and very strong winds over the next 24 hours. But it does calm down a bit into the Easter weekend with lighter winds, more of a southerly airflow as well. So that will help boost the temperatures a little bit. So in any sunshine, it should feel fine. But Easter Monday looks like we're back to the unsettled regime. So this morning, let's take a look at the details. And it is a wet start out there. 
there. We've got a warning still in force until 10 a.m. for eastern parts of Northern Ireland near to Belfast. There's been a lot of rain there and continues to be rain there this morning and into this afternoon across parts of Scotland. Rain will be moving up to uh, hill snow across the higher elevations and rain moving northwards across England and Wales too. So the mid-afternoon picture across Scotland is that of rain across the far north with hill snow, uh, patchy rain further south, brighter and drier conditions for Northern Ireland later, but a few showers are likely in sunshine and showers across England and Wales. Some of them will be heavy and thundery, especially out towards western areas where the winds will start to strengthen as we head into tonight as well. Temperatures around average for the time of year and any sunshine it should feel pleasantly mild up to 13 degrees Celsius. Then overnight we'll continue to see a few showers across the west but most of them do fade away and for a time it will be uh, mostly dry and clear by the early hours of the morning across Scotland and Northern Ireland where a patchy frost is likely. Further south though we're seeing the next batch of wet weather travel up, up towards uh, Keith Lemon apparently uh, <laughs> for parts of Wales, the Midlands, Central and Eastern England. And down towards the southwest we're seeing another batch down towards Devon and Cornwall towards the early hours of the morning. Now, both areas of weather will be moving northwards throughout tomorrow, uh, over towards areas of southern Scotland as well. Central and northern parts of Scotland looking mostly fine and bright, but as you can see, southern Scotland could see some heavy downpours, as will Northern Ireland, and it's sunshine and showers again for England and Wales. Again, some heavy and thundery out towards the west, maybe even some hail mixed in too. But as I said, getting calmer into the <laughs> Easter weekend. Can you back? <laughs> well done. Um. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, thank you to Naz and Keith Lemon there. Uh, let's have another look I, through this morning. Can I just say, I ain't, if we've been hacked, I ain't apologising to Vladimir Putin. He can do one. There are gremlins in this damn studio. But listen, something's going wrong. But yeah. I tell you what's going right. It is Rebecca Hudson and Jack Elson <laughs> from the Sun. Well, Never he's just come from Barbados, so he's happy, isn't he? Right, Rebecca. <laughs> let's start with uh, page twenty of the Sun. Terrifying story. Um, mm. Taliban to stone and flog women. Yes. Um, so obviously, when the when the Taliban returned to power in kind of August 2021, they sort of promised that they had this slightly more kind of reformed view of of women, and they promised that young girls would be able to go to school. And um, although they obviously weren't promising to be a progressive society, they they were kind of trying to assuage the concerns of kind of the West that the experience of women in Afghanistan would be improved. Lo and behold, um, over the weekend, one of their supreme leaders went on kind of national television to talk about the fact that they will be stoning women for adultery, which is kind of one of these charges in Afghanistan that's slightly trumped up for women. So that can include things if you are assaulted or raped, um, if you are the victim of incest, um, if you're a woman that's just kind of, I don't know, maybe a little outspoken, if you're seen without a guardian. It's kind of one of these yeah. accusations that get levied against women in the community or then basically ostracised, and then you are subjected to this heinous, heinous punishment. And, you know, what is being done to support the women of, and women of gov girls of Afghanistan? I kind of search me, I'm not really sure. I feel like they've been completely abandoned. We always knew under the Taliban that the lives of women and girls were basically non-existent. And for someone to go on television and broadcast that we're a week on and what's being done about it i think speaks volumes about how how we've kind of abandoned the, yeah. the plight of it's women it's absolutely there. terrifying yeah. and and also it's it's not muslim it's, yeah. it's not part of Islam at all. And, and you will see often um, the, the laws of Islam being misinterpreted and misused for, for various other purposes. But uh, actually within that religion, women are so well respected that these are extremists mm. yeah. who are abusing... Um, That's the word that yeah. you have to use. That's that it. Word, don't you? Yeah. These are extremists, the extremists. Who, who are justifying their actions through religion, which yeah. is absolutely not... It's horrible. Yeah. It's just sickening. And I just think, you know, how many British American lives were lost in Afghanistan yep. trying to rebuild mm. that country? It finally got to a place where actually, you know, they did have some good women's rights. It wasn't perfect, no. mm. but it was it, it was okay. And the fact that, you know, they've basically just gone back, you know, 50 years, you know, it's medieval. It's absolutely mm. disgusting what's happening yeah. there. But, you know, how do you try and help the situation? It's so difficult trying to get any sort of aid in whatsoever because the Taliban has now got like an iron grip over every institution. It's so mm. difficult, but it's, it's hard. You look at, you look, you know, whoever you are and whatever your politics, you look at how... America, England, whatever, withdrew. And, and, yeah. and it, and it yeah. struck me that it was one of those... It was a bit like Vietnam. Mm -hmm. It would have gone on for years and years and they made <clears throat> their reasons and their excuses to leave. And, in fact, has it changed that much? When you read rubbish yeah. like that, well, when you we wouldn't think through, very much at all, right? Dominic Raab was on a beach, Quite. wasn't he? Our yeah. foreign secretary at the time. He's also given up. Well, one. Mm. Yeah. moving on yeah. now, Jack, Jack, to the story in The Express. 
Yes, um, the final two of David Neal's reports came out yesterday. He was the guy who was inspect independent yes. inspector of borders and immigration, sacked by uh, James Cleverley for leaking parts of it to the media ahead of time. Um, so two reports came out yesterday. One was about London City Airport and how high-risk flights were coming into the country, hardly going through any checks whatsoever. Basically, officials were being quite blundering, um, you know, high-risk flights, you know, potential um, drug smuggling or gun smuggling. Got Private um, jets. Um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, weren't going through the checks needed. Mm. Um, and then the, the second report was uh, probably even more extraordinary, which was about um, the care sector and how um, the the, the, there's a mad scramble to plug staffing shortages in the care sector uh, led to um, a massive rush of people coming in, but they weren't being checked at all. And so... Um, there was an extraordinary case in his report which found that 275 visas were issued to people to go and work in a care home that didn't even exist. It was a couple of... I do, honestly, I am turning into myself, but the, the, uh, it, it's a joke, man. What, what, honestly, Jack, seriously, without me... What does work in this country? 275 visas to work in a care home that doesn't exist. At what point do our politicians switch on and go so much of the systems that we have don't work. They're well, a joke. I know, and it does seem that the Home Office is always at the sharp end of these um, you well, know, allegations about working. They've just, got, they've just got so much on. Like, if you think about, like, the Home Office, like, the breadth of stuff they have to actually do... Then do what somebody suggested on this show, have an immigration department, have a separate entity, a separate government yeah. building that has experts that can deal with that. Yeah, completely. Somebody said the other day about the passport thing, I was sending off for Henry for a passport. Do you remember two years ago, you'd have to wait six months before they oh, sorted yeah. out that by yeah. getting a, a department together and employing people? The same could be done with immigration, the same could be done with the Home Office. There doesn't seem to be, we talked earlier about the NHS, there doesn't seem to be a, an enthusiasm, Rebecca, to, mm. to, to mend things that are patently broken. Yeah, and this has real-life consequences. You know, we've spoken about what happens when people who shouldn't be in this country or shouldn't be in the community are able to be, which yeah. is the heinous case of the alkaline attack in Clapham. We talk about those awful blokes that have managed to get out of the country to go and join Putin in Russia. You know, yeah. it just there's this sense that our borders are kind of these porous unenforced things and, it, and, and there are real life consequences for it. You know, people bringing drugs into this country yeah. spills out into the streets of London and our big city, well, in fact, everywhere with, with gang violence and knife crimes. So th these things actually really matter and we need to get a grip um, because it just makes, it makes everything feel a bit lawless and like nothing's working. Completely yeah. agree. We're going to move on. Um, uh, if you just, um, this, Rebecca, this is uh, <sighs> the Times. I'll keep very quiet because I absolutely... <laughs> Of the BBC, oh. do me a favour. Well, the BBC intends to introduce wow. a progressive licence fee for the very first time, which is good news for, for poorer households. Yes, yeah, so I thought you actually might, might quite like this. No, I do, well. but it's not far enough. That, that Somebody needs to tell the BBC that television has changed immeasurably and people are not going to pay 170 quid mm. to watch content that they don't choose to watch. Mm. The world is not going to be like that in three to five years, trust me, it's no, not. No, the BBC I... obviously has a different remit to, to other broadcasters. Yes, yes, so this is Tim Davey, who yesterday was addressing um, a, a kind of... Uh, a body of, of broadcasters and for the first time ever suggesting the licence fee, rather than being a flat fee that we all pay, obviously there are sort of certain dispensations if you're over 70, um, that potentially the sort of poorer or lower income households will pay less and wealthier incomes would contribute more. He didn't exactly commit to it, but he's kind of said that they're going to Means start... testing for means your licence fee. Yeah, and they're, they're going to begin the biggest consultation ever yeah. about how the BBC is funded. I mean, you're right, they do a very different remit and that they are a national broadcaster they're not the same as a netflix or a commercial station that's there to drive revenue and make kind of commercial gain they are there to be an important but the, an the answer to that is that a commercial you're right on my healthy horse now a commercial television or radio station has to attract viewers or listeners yes. because then its advertisers will buy into that audience yeah. the bbc does not have to buy any viewers or anything and gets this money and can put out whatever content it wants and state broadcaster really i'd say they're a biased broadcaster. well it can't put out whatever content it mm. wants, can it? It no. has to show... That, that this is what I mean, that there are certain rules that they have to abide by, abide by in order to receive yeah. this licence. I think it's another uh, organisation, frankly, that's have, not fit for purpose anymore, sorry. And, but, so the, the responsibility should go on the BBC to ensure that their programming, their presenters, their outlook reflects everyone in this country and it doesn't feel... It doesn't feel alienating. You're smirking. No, we're only smirking because <laughs> there's another technical difficulty oh, right. in our era. We're trying oh, to be okay. really professional. Oh, well, we'll, we'll worry. pretend that's not happening. Sorry, Nick. Um, Jack, yes, where do you stand on that? Um, listen, I think you're completely right. The world has completely changed and, uh, you know, on-demand, um, you know, subscription models seem to be the ones that are blazing the trail and the ones mm. who are making all the money and t dragging in all the eyeballs. Um, I just, I just don't think that any sort of like politicians will stomach a progressive system when it comes to the license fee. Like yeah. it seems like that contract is already 
at, you know, basically being stretched very, very thinly between people willing to pay. And I think that any change to that um, won't won't be stomachs. But you know, I, I, I do actually feel I, it will further enhance the argument that the BBC doesn't have to justify itself. And I say that only actually. We can have an argument about content, but I say that in terms of how the world has changed in broadcasting, and, and it really has. Do you think there shouldn't be uh, a public broadcaster then, a state broadcaster? No, it's, well, it's not a state broadcaster, is it? Do, do you think that, you know, in order for the BBC to exist and be impartial and be, you know, technically for everybody, have an offering for everybody, they can't pick and choose who pays for them. Now, they might be able to pick and choose how much mm. people pay, but they certainly can't be seen to be gearing their content towards those who can afford rather than those who can't. I, I'm just wondering what the answer is. I know, and it's so tricky, isn't it? And, like, you know, there's so many journalists I know at the BBC, so many I respect, and I do think that a lot of their news output is actually quite good. Um, Tim Davies recognised itself that, you know, it's, it's not always perfect, and I think yeah. that a lot of the times they do uh, stray towards a certain direction, uh, sure. let's put it, and they do obviously make mistakes. Um, but it's the devil in the deep blue sea, yeah. isn't it? Because it, it's, that, it's exactly what Nick just said. It's whether you feel in 2024 and what's happening to media that we need a state broadcaster. I think you have to, I think you have to approach it from people's personal choice. And that's not just in terms of where we select what we watch, and it's not how state we watch it. Yeah. I, no, no, but it's I, a national I, broadcaster. I don't think, I don't, all right, national broadcaster. I, I'm not sure in years to come. I believe, and I've said it for months, you'll get a screen, there'll be 200 things, one will be news, one will be sport, one will be this, mm. one will be... And I think, people, I think the world... I, I genuinely think the world has changed, and I don't, I don't think the BBC is going to be fit for purpose much longer. I really believe I that. I think they do some events incredibly yes, well. Yes, completely I think they do, agree. like, you know, royal completely events very agree. well. I think they do general election coverage, you know, really well on general election night. I think they do, you know, the fact that they show, uh, you know, BBC Parliament and stuff like that, it's only w watched by nerds like me, but I, th I think it actually fulfills a certain purpose. You're not a nerd, Jack. You're a nice oh, boy. Well, oh, thanks very much. He's yeah. a cool nerd. Exactly. Uh, but, uh, but a cool nerd. Yeah. But a, lot, but a lot of, like, the drama shows, um, yes, yeah, some of them are all right, some of them are really not. And the fact that you have other uh, entities, you know, producing these sort of, like, dramas. You, you can know, choose to, exactly. I suspect hey. in the years to come, you can choose to watch their royal coverage or whatever hmm. you... That's what I think. Mrs Brown's Boys is one of the most popular shows on television. I will never understand why, but that's not up to me to decide. What, Jeremy? That's my friend. You're not insulting that person. No, 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 no. I'm saying it's a very, very popular show, but people are, you know, people are... Uh, and I can't see why. Disagree, <laughs> yeah, people disagree. I think maybe, I mean, I think like many television programmes, looking straight down the camera, the world has changed, and certain television programmes, perhaps in the 90s or the 2000s, are, it's a different world. But I do think the bigger argument here is media has to check. Keith Lemon keeps flashing up. It's really confusing me. But you have to just, I think, I think the BBC's going to have to move yeah, quite definitely, dramatically. Definitely, definitely. That's what I'd say. Right, moving on to the next story now. Boots will become the first to sell... COVID jabs. This is selling them, obviously, not the first to, to yeah. give them out. This will please Julia Hartley Brewer, won't it? Well, they've sort, of been, they've sort of been winding down the actual free jabs, which they've been handing out, because, you know, actually, COVID now, we're learning to live with it. There's, you know, very, very small amounts of it now in the community. It's sort of becoming like the flu of the common cold. Yeah. So, like the flu, you can go into your local boots and for 99 quid, get a jab, be administered in the store. They're the first ones trialling it. But I think this basically speaks to a wider point that... Um, COVID now is something which we're going to be living with. It's not something which is going to be treated like you know, the epidemic, which it was, you know, the lockdown, which it was. We're, you know, a million miles away from that. Um, and so if you want to fork out 99 quid for a jab... Um, people will, though. I can't see that. I think people, if people are vulnerable, um, they certainly might do. Are they, they not going like to give they're... it to free to the vulnerable and the elderly? Oh, yeah, I mean, potentially, but... Care, you know. Yeah, care residents and elderly yes. people, yes. But, but getting COVID still can knock you out for, you know, a good couple yeah. of weeks. And not everyone can afford to take that time out of work. Not no. everyone, you know, not everyone's got the luxury. You know, if you're on a zero-hours contract, if you've got kids you know, kind of not being well enough for a couple of weeks is quite bad. So although this is great, you can buy it, I think there probably should be a bit more provision for people. Dave makes a good point. You have to quid. pay for a flu jab, don't you? Yeah. You do. That's a good yeah. point, to be fair. What about kids who have never had it? Would parents want to pay that money to try and... I think, it, sure it, feels, I think it feels very expensive. I think 100 quid is quite a lot. It's a lot of money, isn't yeah. it? But it shows how far we've come. I mean, it's, yeah. it's four years. I can't remember. What was the exact date that we went into lockdown? 26th of March, Can I it? Can, I do, something, yeah. can oh, I do something yeah. personal? Oh, it was a year yes. yesterday. Yeah. Oh, really? well, yeah, yeah. well, four years yesterday. And oh, how really? far we've come yeah. in that time. It feels like yesterday yes. to me. Without yeah. bringing everything down, um, just because she's a mate of mine, Kate Garraway, did you watch that um, oh, documentary last night? Yeah. Yeah, uh, just gosh. watch it on catch up. Yeah. This is an incredible lady, by the way. And Derek Draper, what happened to him, is actually mm. a an absolute reason for us to never not take a pandemic yeah. seriously. Yeah. And I think 
Yes, money, but I, if you get a chance, guys, yeah. just 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 check that out. And it's also really what incredible. she says about the, the costs of care. She said at one point the very basic care mm -hmm. for Derek, her husband, was sixteen thousand pounds a so, month. I have read such terrible things about my friend saying, "Oh, well, you can afford it." This woman is facing financial ruin, and it's a fact yeah. because she mm. had to put her career aside to do this. And it, it, but it's an amazing yeah. piece of television. Watch yeah. it, it if really you get a chance. Can what channel is it on? Chance? What? what channel is it on? I, I can't say that word. Could you do it? Oh, right. Could you say that word? I can't say it on television. <laughs> Moving on now <laughs> to the Express uh, Beckett Censors. This is a very, very funny oh, story indeed. Oh, this is a great story. Now, tell me why censors have blurred out a picture <laughs> of Alan Titchmarsh. Well, it might be the first time he's ever been censored, do you think? Um, so, yes, yeah, so Alan Titchmarsh, <laughs> um, Gardner <laughs> Supremo, um, is a huge hit in North Korea, <laughs> but um, they have to blur his trousers because he's wearing <laughs> jeans which are seen as a sort of symbol of Western imperialism and they're banned in North Korea. So you Stop. don't see images of denim because it's yeah, seen as kind of, you know, the ultimate kind of capitalist fabric. So he, his trousers sort of muzzed and it sort of looks like it should be more sort of sinister and naughty than it is. Like they are just blurring a pair of jeans. It looks like maybe you should be wearing... And, 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 I, it and I don't mean to that particular picture there. Look at those couple of apples yeah. placed rather strategically. <laughs> <laughs> you seen that? He's got a couple of apples where his jeans yeah. oh, were. Oh, yeah. Alan, right. Well, thank you so much to Rebecca and Jack. They'll be Thanks, back with guys. more papers in just under an hour. Uh, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions as always. Jeremy, what have you got for us? Uh, I think it's OK. We were doing this thing about should MPs uh, get a three-week recess over the Easter holidays. Go and eat chocolate when the country's gone uh, to, to whatever. Graham says, if they can have a three-week excess from work paid for us, why can't we have the same? Well, Anthony says, there's too much going on for them to have such a long break from Parliament. But then again, the way they're running the country, maybe a very long holiday is needed. And Chloe says, our politicians seemingly can do whatever they want, but if they choose to take nearly a month off, I hope that all of them could come back with some sort of plan to deal with all the damage they've been causing. Talk today. At talk.tv, text to 87 treble 2. Still to come on today's show, Shaban is here with the sport. Good morning, thank you very much. Wales suffered a dramatic loss at Cardiff City Stadium last night against Poland, missing out on qualifying for the Euros. And it came down to a single penalty. We'll get into all that very soon. And French football fans are divided over the size of the cockerel on the team's new kit and which club supporters are the worst behaved. A full list has been revealed. I'll have all of the details on that next on Top Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. 
And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.47. Now, Wales have failed to qualify for Euro 2024 after losing to Poland in a penalty shootout in Cardiff. It was really sad. I'm here to give us all the highlights. And apparently she's going to do this first story uh, as I speak. Uh, Siobhan Hearn, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> she's what doing her Jeremy night? Kyle impression. Heartbreak from Wales, <laughs> some might say. <laughs> That's the best I can do. No, listen, serious story. I feel so sorry so for Wales I. this morning. And especially for Dan James. They win together, they lose together, but when it's one person misses that penalty after a goalless draw 120 minutes later, that is one way to go out of qualifying for the That US. near one kick, sweet. I mean, it was it was really sad. Mm -hmm. And you're right about one player. So, Nick, you, maybe not, but I remember Southgate missed the penalty yes, and got slaughtered yes. for years, mm -hmm. didn't he? They made pizza adverts and stuff. Mm -hmm. Dan oh. James had a great season release, but yes, down to one kick. And, and however consoled he is by his teammates, that's going to sit heavily. Oh, isn't yeah, it? it must have. And he actually, when you when you watched the footage last night, he almost didn't realise himself that that was the final penalty and that was the moment. Wow. Um, so unfortunate. Feeling it for Wales fans today too, missing out on qualification and Poland now joined France, Netherlands, and Austria. But for me, if it's got to that point where it's nil all. It's about all the other misses that happened in the game, rather than true. that. And they had a goal penalty. disallowed too. What? Goodness me, that was incisive. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, <laughs> would you say, here's the thing for you. Um, Robert Page, who stepped in and did a great job after um, Ryan Giggs, yeah. of course, with the Ferrari over his court cases. Um, does he stay, Page? I, I think he should. I, I think do, I he do is think a he should. brilliant manager. Don't I mean, do. the thing is, he will be questioned about the decisions that he's made. Should he have started Kiefer Moore? Should he not? Should he have brought an Aaron Ramsey on, say, for the penalties? He will be questioned about You'll that. You'll always be questioned. Of course you will. But you look at the penalty takers last night. I think he put out his best side and it wasn't to be. Bless what about him. England? Well, we're focusing on them last night. Go. The Here pouring comes the rain issue, at go. Wembley. It ended to all thanks to a stoppage... 94th minute winner from your star man Jude Bellingham. I think that really took the pressure off fans and Gareth Southgate and the players as they head towards the Euros. OK, let's remember it's just a friendly, but defensive errors, goalkeeper errors. This is one thing that we're seeing Gareth Southgate is starting to kind of play about with the squad in these friendlies, but the goalkeeper got, a, got a lot of riches up front. Thought Tony looked great. You Tony think was... Manu at 18, Bellingham, Rice, Saka to come back, Foden. The back concerns me. John John Stones limps off. He limps off. Kyle Walker, whatever we think about him, is is our best right back. He's injured. Terence Trent Derby isn't playing. Luke Shaw won't make it. And no disrespect to Lewis Dunk and whoever else was on the pitch last night. They didn't look defensively cohesive call at all. Who's Terence Trent Derby? You know who he is. <laughs> what? The guy from Liverpool. <laughs> Trent Alexander Trent Arnold. Alexander, I do it as a joke. All right. <laughs> Are you just saying? Yes. Like, <laughs> Trent Alexander Trent Derby. Um, what I'm trying to say to you is the defence is to it's me shaking. quite brittle, and if the number one, you know, defence isn't there, and also questions about yes. Pickford, I completely agree, yeah. but, but one yeah. bad game, what do you do? Listen, I think you'll be absolutely fine at the Euros. I guess fans just want to be inspired in these friendlies, especially at Wembley. Sure. But on you go. All right, we're going to talk about the Lionesses now because Leah Williamson returns to the squad for the Euro 2025 qualifier. Yeah, she's back in. Of course, she captained the side to win the Euros. She was out with an ACL injury, then suffered a little bit of a knock in the, na in the last international camp. So she is back um, and will likely lead the squad and captain them against France and the Republic of Ireland in the European qualifiers. Now, another thing that Serena Wiegmann spoke about was the fact that Arsenal have planned this friendly all-stars trip to Australia a week before the international qualifiers. Mm. So they're going to play in Melbourne a week 
exactly before they're due to play each other. So that affects the likes of, say, Leah Williamson, Lotta Wibben Moy, Alessia Russo, Beth Mead, Katie McCabe also plays for Arsenal. She'll represent the Republic of Ireland. You think, of all the ACL injuries that are happening, and we know that travel might have part of that to do, mm -hmm. why are you sending your players to the other side of the world mm. for a bit of fun and um, a fun game? All of that very that? interesting. But I, when I woke up this morning and saw we were doing this, I've waited four hours. <laughs> Ladies, how do you feel about a big, large French cock a rule on the shirt of the French football team? Because this has caused a massive... Enough? Uh, Ferrari, hasn't it? It's the size wow. of the cockerel. Did you feel emasculated by this story, <laughs> Jeremy? This is you just... brought this up this morning, well, mate. <laughs> it was. Um, this is. Uh, yeah, Sorry. Nike at it Speechless. again. The Fran shirt, um, a lot of fans divided over the size of the cockerel. And actually, when you, you look at it, it's quite it's quite overpowering, isn't it? It is quite... A, cockerel. It, it, yeah, it does quite look quite out of place. It's quite a large one. Y yeah, totally disproportionate, uncalled for even, uh, some fans saying that. And then others are saying some, the bigger the cockerel, the better. So... Wow. How do you feel about that, Nick? Well, I don't think size matters. I think it's it's how you wear it. Um, right, <laughs> moving on. That is, that is really good. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, God, man. Talk to me about the Premier League of mm. shame. Yes. Are we on it? Well, the list of football clubs with Not the most high. fans arrested and banned oh, oh, has this. been revealed. Who? Manchester United. Oh, really? Are top of the list. This, this, this is so... I think this is a horrible thing to see about your club, mm. a yes, Manchester United fan. Tragedy chanting, we're hearing more and more and more. Yep. You know, the, the fan violence that happens, you are the, one of the biggest clubs in the world. Why on earth are your fans behaving like that? Are you telling yeah. me that West Ham are the worst? It's embarrassing. Look at the state of you. The work that, in terms of arrests. Sixty nine percent in terms of arrests for fan violence and, wow. and football behaviour. It's unbelievable. It's what terrible. is tragedy chanting? This is where, um, for example, see the Munich disaster, um, for the Hillsborough disaster, that fans have got songs that they chant to the the, the team, making fun of That's the awful. tragedies that happened. It's terrible. just sickening. And the more we talk about it, the more it seems to happen. And we keep talking about PSR, get your club in order, get your rules and regulations in place, and then you will be docked points. And then I think, well. Why shouldn't they be docked points for fans behaving like absolute idiots? Why can't they have that? And the order? argument to that is when sure. people go, well, it's not down to the to the to the club. Well, my argument to that is you're taking the revenue from those people coming through Absolutely. the doors. So the security Bannon. and the behaviour of those fans is ultimately your responsibility. I think that's disgusting. There's yeah. Keith Lemon again. I think that's disgusting. <laughs> Could to they be not honest. just stop play? I think it, when it comes to racism in football, you know, players will now stop until the referee mm. has everything addressed. Okay. I think right. if it is continues, you can only see now. Look at Vinicius Junior in that press conference from Brazil sorry, yeah. the other day. The abuse he is receiving, you know, 10 reports, 10 instances have all been already just this season being looked into from Vinicius Junior. That's outrageous. He's only a young man trying to play the game. And this, it's, it's unbelievable. This last story about Fulham is extraordinary because you know Fulham has the poshest fans, don't oh, you? Yes, I mean... You Hugh can... Grant supports Fulham. Oh. Kevin O'Sullivan. Don't know what the, you know, the analogy there is. But this is the plushest stand in the history of football. This is brilliant, this yeah. story. It is brilliant, but Fulham fans don't love it. Reason being, they want to focus on the football. But the, the new owner wants a Michelin star restaurant and a pool next to the Riverside stand. And you're right, it's a very lovely place to go, but is this what football represents? A Michelin star meal and a swim and then catch the game? You could be looking at a ticket price for up to three grand from that. What's important here? But we're real football well, fans. it's interesting because what does football represent? Because at the end of the day, you've got players on the pitch who are paid hundreds of thousands of pounds a week. Maybe that is exactly what football represents, which is a, a kind of two-tier system of the fans are the, the working thing. in middle class and the footballers on the pitch are, are multi-millionaires. The, the thing that'll happen is, I'll bet you any money, that, that bit will be plugged out with wags, girlfriends and families of players, because nobody else will be able to afford it. I well, yeah, maybe, quite. Well, maybe Fulham, you see, South West London, maybe there's a bit more money. Well, this is it. I mean, it's a very posh stadium that you can make your way to, a little trip along the Thames, take in the sights, maybe have brunch at the River Cafe first, if you can afford it. Then £10,000 is the maximum price to get this match to experience at the Riverside Stand. It's been a five-year development, £80 million project. So they better hope they sell that out. Very interesting. I love having you on here. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank Steve. you, Siobhan. Are you here tomorrow? No. <laughs> Boom. Oh, well, we'll give up then. Right. Thank you so thanks, much. Thanks, darling. Shibana Appreciate it. Talk sport. Still to come on the programme. Two Brits are dubbed traitors for joining Putin's army. We'll ask Ukrainian MP Kira Ruddick her thoughts when she joins us in the studio in the next hour. This is Talk Today. It is 7.56.
A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we was supposed to it was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. It's just gone 8 o'clock on Wednesday the 27th of March. You'll be talk today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories this morning. Continued Tory turmoil. I can't say that word. A double resignation forces Sunak into a mini reshuffle as Education Minister Robert Halfon and Armed Forces Minister James Epe both quit their posts. A total disgrace. Two Brits are dubbed traitors as they join the ranks of Putin's army. Ukrainian MP Kira Ruddick shares her thoughts on the matter as she joins us in the studio this hour. And this will get you going out of office as MPs head off on, yes, three weeks of Easter recess. We'll ask, do they deserve three weeks holiday? We'll do that with two former Westminster stalwarts this hour. And there will be sunshine today, but there will be plenty of showers as well as spells of rain and hill snow. It's all going on and I've got the details in the forecast a little later. Cheers, now. now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The search for six missing people following the bridge disaster in Baltimore has come to an end. As rescuers say, they're now presumed dead. The Coast Guard says it suspended its recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. 
Several vehicles were on the bridge at the time it fell into the river, and officials have since revealed that the vessel suffered power problems before it issued a distress call moments before the crash. Well, Maryland Governor Wes Moores paid tribute to the victims. They were family members. They were fathers and brothers. They were cousins. They were, uh, they were sons. And, um, and to get a chance to spend time with the family members who were remembering them, uh, not, not just ex not exclusively as, as hard workers who are working on something that's very important to our long-term success and our long-term pride as a city and a state. Back here and there are concerns of a continuing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers announced their departure from the party. Robert Halfen became the 63rd politician to say he'll not stand in the next election. He was joined by the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who also resigned. Previously unseen pictures of the Clapham acid attacker getting baptised have emerged as new documents reveal the church that carried it out knew about his criminal past. The Grange Road Baptist Church limited Abdul Azadi's rights to attend services after a sexual assault conviction, but then supported his claim to stay in Britain. A new survey has revealed that public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. The long-running British Social Attitudes research shows that just 24% of people were happy with services in 2023, with most people concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. It's a 5% decline since the previous year. And Katie Price says she wants to educate young women about how damaging plastic surgery can be to the body. The former model says there's nothing worse than young women getting fillers in their early 20s and says she's deterred her own children from going under the knife. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour's time. Thank you so much indeed, Emily. Yes, uh, listen, thank you also, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm not doing it. Uh, thank you so much indeed for uh, your involvement in the show. Lots of things we asked you to comment today about. Uh, obviously, the... Um, the number of Tory MPs quitting, now 63. Uh, some comments on that. Just one I want to read out as well, because we're, we're going to do it this hour. You know, um, MPs, despite everything that's going on in the world, two ministers have resigned. The world's, you know, what's happening in, in Gaza, of course, what's happening in the Middle East, everything that's going on, they're on three weeks' holiday. Now, they'll tell you, of course, they're going to their constituencies to work very hard. Many people think that, that actually you should be back and uh, it's too long. Linda, I love this, Nick. I'm a carer earning 76 quid a week with a few other side hustles, really. Most of my earnings go into taxes. On top of being on call 24-7 for my elderly father, I also work throughout the pandemic, all my weekends and bank holidays. Still here I am with no holiday in 10 years, unable to afford heating in the winter. I don't see MPs of all parties helping people like me. That is the issue, isn't it? What do you make Absolutely. of it? Talk today at talk.tv. Text to 8722. Get in touch, please. Now, our top story today. Fresh chaos for the Tory party. More fresh chaos as two more MPs quit, forcing Rishi Sunak to organise a mini reshuffle. Mini. Well, James Heapy has been replaced by Leo Doherty as Armed Forces Minister. And in a change to the Education Minister role, Robert Halfen has stepped aside and been replaced by... Luke Hall. Who? Well, joining us now is City AM's Opinions and Features Editor Alice Denby and former Ministerial Advisor Leon Emerali. Alice, is this just rearranging <laughs> the deck chairs on the Titanic? That is an outrageous <laughs> slur. <laughs> I mean, you know, they've got to fill the jobs, haven't they, if someone yeah, quits? I, th I think what's kind of sad about the state that the Conservative Party finds itself in is people like Robert Halfen are good just man. giving up. A good man, a real champion of kind of blue collar Conservatives, real, um, real campaigner for more apprenticeships on fuel duty and things like that, 25 years experience, and he's thinking, what's the point anymore? And many MPs like him, really good people, are going to be quit quitting or losing their seats the next election, and we're going to see a whole new, uh, probably much less experienced... But, but you see, that is, that is the frustration. And, and we were saying earlier, um, Leon, that, that what happens is you get nearer to an election, everybody decides, right, do I quit because I've got no chance? Do I align myself to this person because they're going to be the next leader? Do I walk away from... Oh, no, the fact of the matter is, right, and I'm, I'm no fan of, of any of them, frankly, at the moment, why don't they just call a damn general election and get this malaise and this sleepwalking to misery done, man? Because for me, it's ludicrous now. It is yeah, ludicrous, it is. isn't it? It is, in a way. I mean, it's very difficult, I think, to see the Conservatives take any kind of victory or any kind yeah. of solace into what's going to happen. So it's what's done, going on in... Well, I mean, everyone's saying that it could narrow the nearer we get 
to the election itself. When it gets to that campaign between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, it might narrow. And I think it will narrow from where it is currently, Mate, but I, not I, enough. Listen, I, I, you know where I stand, right? And I try and be open-minded. Rishi Sunak has been saying that for a year and he has made no difference. He has taken the Tory party backwards from Liz Truss. Well, Just call an election. The, the example I'd give is 2017, when it was Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn. Theresa May was miles ahead in mm. the polls, miles mm. ahead at this stage, and then it got to that head-to-head -head and actually it was frighteningly close and Jeremy Corbyn nearly became Prime Minister. So, you know, it does happen when those short campaigns begin and we could see it happen, but I do think it's slightly wishful thinking to see any kind of, uh, of victory for the Conservatives at this point. Do you think people, some Tory voters, could see this as a, a fresh start for the party, you know, with such an influx of, of new, albeit mm. inexperienced, people in roles? I want to, for the fresh start for the Conservative Party, I don't think this reshuffle will be as significant as that. I don't think people are really going to notice. I think, though, on the other hand, people calling for a change of leadership now, I think, have frankly lost their minds. I think, you know, whatever happens, as you say, it's... Um... Why would anybody take that? Would you just go, do you know what I'd be going? If Got I wanted to be the next... I doubt you would. I don't think anybody who wants to be the next leader of the Tory party would think anything differently than, you know what, Sunak, you can shoulder this and do one. That, I, it will, it will, madness, man. Yeah, well, Let him take it. Call it and take it. That's it. I think Ben Wallace put it uh, brilliantly when he said, look, at some point, you've just got to put your suit on and march towards the sound of the guns. And I think that's what... Well, now, that is a really interesting doing. analogy. I don't know if Nick wants to do this, but I want to talk about the defence thing, because Heapy was the armed forces minister who has been making, you know, comments about we should spend more. Ben Wallace stalked off well, our longest-serving defence secretary, saying we don't even spend 2.5 of GDP. With what's going on in the world, we had Paul Richard is the Labour advisor saying Labour needs to commit to this. I think that Grant Shapps is also on manoeuvres because he started saying yesterday, why is Sunak not listening? That's a traditional Tory value, isn't it? Strong military? It is, and I would keep an eye on what's in the Tory manifesto on that particular point because I do think we are going to move towards right. a number that is closer to 3% of GDP on defence. I agree with you, Jeremy. I think at this point, with Russia as belligerent as they are, with our relationship with China now souring, mm. Donald Trump potentially going to be the US president and his views on NATO. I think the UK and other European allies will start spending more on defence. I think Shaps is right, and I do think there might be something in the Tory manifesto on that. So if we're going to see, allegedly, it's been flirted with, the idea of a, an election in October, when should we expect to see both parties' manifestos, or all parties' manifestos, I should say? Oh, I think isn't technically sort of six weeks you have to for a campaign. Yeah. So I think pretty soon after an election is called, you'll see a manifesto within a, a week or so, I yeah. would reckon. So, so they know what's in there right now, right? I think they'll put, be putting it together. But, I mean, so the Labour Party has to go through incredible contortions to get its manifesto together. It has to go through the unions and the NEC and so on. For the Conservative Party, it's a much simpler... To go to the Garrett Club and just write it. <laughs> I think a lot of them had, had prepared certainly a lot, a lot of the information for those manifestos when there was that panic a couple of weeks ago. But, but you know, you that know, we like, were going to have a May election. You know the non-dom thing, right? Yeah. So it's quite interesting because patently the Labour Party have been going non-dom, non-dom for, for about two years. It's going to pay for everything. What's three billion quid? It's not. The Tories nicked that. I suppose suspect at the moment it's a bit of shadow boxing, right? Yeah. We don't want to show our hand too quickly. But but from a political point of view. Um, I, I don't have any sympathy with Sunak because he wanted the job and he, and he, and he did his best uh, to, to crawl over people to get it. I think his time of reckoning is coming, but we were also talking earlier about what happens after. You look across Europe and you go, OK, so some sort of right-wing-esque parties have risen up. Do you see that happening here or do you see that the Tory party reinventing itself, starting again? I think it depends a lot on the scale of the defeat and w yeah. and who's left. So I actually think what's more likely to be kind of the remainder of the Conservative Party after this election will actually be the more sort of one nation... Um, Do you? ..southeastern seats. And I think a lot of the kind of red wall seats um, will, uh, you know, the right will be split uh, by reform up there. So I actually think that the, that the MPs who'll be left actually will be, I think, less sympathetic yeah. to, to that more right-wing populist. I think history tells us the Tories lose an election and usually they, they say to themselves, because we weren't right-wing enough, mm. they then lose the next election and then they coalesce around someone who's in the centre and then they tend to get back into power. We saw that with David Cameron after John Major uh, and, and several leaders in between that didn't quite make it. So I do think it's going to be interesting for the party, but there is clearly a clamour, I think, for more right-wing policies, for lower taxes. This is brilliant. I've just had a, a WhatsApp message from Jonathan Gullis. Oh, he has. Uh, hello, buddy. How are you? Sorry I didn't pick up. Um, bit of a, a crazy day yesterday, but we fight off. That's the new deputy chairman of the Tory party. Well, Very interesting. interesting. What do you make of his appointment to deputy chairman? 
I think Jonathan Gullis is an interesting character. I think that he maybe plays out well to a certain demographic that in the Red Wall, the Northern Conservatives. I think he has a role to play. Passionate. Um, passionate, for sure, but also divisive. And I think that's difficult for him uh, and for the party to square. And, Alice, we were talking about this in the previous hour to Alicia Fitzgerald. Do you think that it's a wise uh, appointment because he's very much in the same lane, we could say, as Lee Anderson? Or is it a foolish appointment because he's in the same lane as Lee Anderson? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be a mistake for the Tories to try and compete with, uh, re with reform. I think that a lot of voters um, who switched to the Conservatives in the 2019 election, uh, you know, are not traditional Conservative voters. And Don't you remember what Boris said? Oh, You've what? lent us your vote. We have to prove that, that le you lending it was the right thing. And did he? So, they got rid of him. If he'd had to have swallowed this, I guess he'd have swallowed it. I still maintain, I know all about Partygate and everything, I have a very strong belief, which nobody will change, I don't believe it was right for Major, I don't believe it was right for Rishi Sunak, I don't believe you should be the Prime Minister of this country until the British people have voted for you. And all the people will go, yes, Jeremy, but it's about the Tory party. No, no, no. For me, more than ever before, it would be like Blair, OK, being usurped. Blair won in 97 because he was Tony Blair. Boris Johnson won in 2019 because he was Boris Johnson. And if people were, as I know they were, that unimpressed with Boris Johnson, they should have thrown him out of the general election. Not a bunch of Tory MPs who have torn themselves to shred and torn the party to shred. He, That's a true He comment. did resign, though. For, but Nick, everybody resigned and he had nobody left there on his own like this. But, like the, you know, are. there were votes of no confidence, etc. You could on. also argue he, he ended up leaving the job because he was Boris Johnson. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I mean, I, I, sorry, Alice, I, I think his character, Boris Johnson's character, was part of his downfall as well as his massive appeal that a lot of people The Tory see. party wouldn't be where it is today. I he agree with Jeremy. I, th I think if, if Boris Johnson was still in power, I do think the polls would be narrower. I Much. think that there would be a lot more of a lot more division in politics. That's not, is, by the way, me Marmite. condoning anything that he got wrong. My, my my overriding emotion about Johnson is complete frustration and anger that an 80-seat majority was squandered by stupid, pathetic mistakes. Because what we're looking at, and, and I'd love your opinion on this, Nick, both Go of on. you, when would the Tories ever get back in the next 10 or 15 years if they have to go back and reinvent themselves? But here's the interesting thing. Four years ago, would any of you sat here with T Jeremy Corbyn, the momentum running Labour, it's worst ever... Would you have thought they were heading for a majority? Four years later, something that happened to the Labour Party has to happen to the Tory party and pretty quick. It's not that bad, because I think Jeremy Corbyn had the full mechanics of the Labour Party yeah. wrapped up. The Conservative Party are far more focused on winning. And we could even okay. see a change of leader before the next election, but they are not as bad in the situation as Labour were at that point, I would say, Jeremy. Interesting. Very interesting indeed. Well, thank you so much to Alice Denby from City AM and former Conservative advisor Leon Emirali. Well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. Uh, the Mail focuses on the Clapham acid attacker who claimed he was a devoted Christian in order to win asylum. Well, Abdul Azidi but was allowed to stay in the UK. Outrageous. The Times says one in four believe the NHS isn't working as satisfaction in the health service falls to a historic low. And heartbreak bridge, cry the Metro, as rescuers search for survivors affected by Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge, which collapsed after a container ship veered off course. Another front page this morning, the Mirror says that two Brits known to be fighting in the Russian army in Ukraine have quite rightly been branded an absolute disgrace. Well, Aidan Minnis and Ben Stimson are the first Brits known to be fighting for Putin, often posting updates from the Ukrainian front line on social media. Well, joining us now is a Ukrainian MP, Kira Rudak. Kira, uh, good morning. Thank good you morning. for joining us. Thank in. you for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. That's pleasure. pleasure. Um, what's your reaction to these two Brits fighting in Putin's war? Well, it's an exception because this allows me to use this opportunity to say that we know and we feel that British people have been one of our strongest allies and Britain has been so good, not only in words, but actually, actually in actions sure. to support Ukraine. Recently, there has been a um, uh, signed a defense agreement between Ukraine and the United Kingdom, and it really helped us to move certain things along in terms of the air defense delivery, in terms of yeah. other military deliveries. So we know that in their majority, British people have been fantastic to us, and we are so, so, so grateful for that. And what more could we do? Mm. What are your requests mm. from the UK at the moment, the UK government? Well, there is a general request that our allies need to switch from the perception of helping Ukraine fight to letting us win the war.
And for that, we need to remove all the limitations that are right now there for delivering the air defense systems, delivering the weapons, the fighter jets, because we need all of that, because we know we can win the war. We just need the weapons, the means, so our enemy, we will not face our enemy empty-handed. We, um, we've spoken many times, Kieran. It's such a privilege to have you on the show today. I go on about this the whole time, and I try and, I try and make it as quick as possible, but I want your response. I understand, by the way, as you will, that in this country right now, it's a cost of living crisis. Uh, people are really struggling. Um, and a lot of people will say, well, hold on a second. War fatigue, you know what I'm going to yeah. say to you. We, we kind of this... I cannot overestimate the importance of the support for Ukraine, and I have been criticised massively for this. And I, I came up with this when I spoke to somebody some weeks ago. The war in Ukraine, ladies and gentlemen, is actually our war as well. Because if Vladimir Putin, who is a dictator, wins in Ukraine, I promise you, on my life, he will put one foot outside Ukraine because the USSR and NATO is legally bound to go to war with him. So when everybody says to you, I get it, I get it, I get it, we have to keep supporting Ukraine because it's not just Ukraine's war, it's our war. Right, Kira? That's true. But it's true. Jeremy, thank you so much no, for but saying I, that's, that. I believe but it, that's genuinely. True. That's absolute true. And about the cost of the living crisis, I totally understand that people in the countries that support us are also struggling with sending money to Ukraine. But there is a solution to that. And the solution is to use Russian money that's being frozen here in Britain, in go. the European That's countries. That's a really good and point. Like, let's use, let's make Putin pay for what he broke. And as of right now, of the, officially, there is about 50 billion pounds uh, frozen of Russian money in the United Kingdom. And we can take those money and use them to support Ukraine in fighting and winning and covering for the damages. Why doesn't and that happen? While we are working with the politicians yes. here and uh, we just need them to take the courage and go ahead with that. And this is what I have been calling since the day one. Let's go ahead and take a stand and use Russian assets Use the oligarch's support. money. Yes, yeah. Yeah. That absolutely. Makes absolutely. Makes sense, absolutely. That's it? the right thing to do. And what do you make of... Donald Trump's comments about Ukraine and the fact that if he were to become US president again, he would cease any funding to Ukraine and the war effort? Well, it's, um, it's a dangerous statement for us and we obviously need to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. However, we know that during the campaign, sometimes politicians are offering their people the simple solutions to the complicated problems. Right. So when one is the president of the United States, I think the stance may be different and we hope it will be different. I, do you know what? I couldn't agree with you more. I'm not sticking up for Donald Trump. We see it in our own politicians we were talking about just now when they're trying to play to a certain segment, when they're trying to curry favour, yeah. they will say anything. Um, can I ask you, um, because we read so much and, and, and you can only go on what you hear, what is the current situation? I've read in the last few weeks Russia is gaining the upper hand, Ukraine is creaking, you say we can win the war. What, what, what is happening in your country? Put it in real terms, Kira. Uh, we have a shortage of weapons and supplies, and this is the truth. So right now what we need is for all the politicians who have made a statement to support us to deliver on this promise everywhere in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in European Union, everywhere. We are trying to go and say, well, let's go ahead and deliver weapons because our people are ready to fight. It's incredibly hard because we are being attacked every single night by Russian missiles, by Russian drones, and these attacks are intensifying. Um, the sanctions are not working as we suppose they would work because Russia can still produce the weapons and missiles and uh, their military production is increasing. But the feeling inside Ukraine is that we just need to get together, mm. stick together and fight together and we will, we will win the war. The spirit, we just, your, the spirit of your people is extraordinary. You know, we the politicians incredible. just need to, to get our people what they need. Put and this is why, we yes, say in England, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, is, this is what, what I need to do. This is what all of us need to do, to get the weapons into hands of Ukrainian soldiers so they can do their job. And Kira, you might have noticed we're wearing these badges today. I stand with Evan. It's one of our colleagues, Evan Gershevich, who's been detained now uh, without trial in Russia for, for over a year. Um, do you have a message for Evan at this time and what are your hopes for his case? We know that Russia is an absolute evil and that they are acting as terrorists. But we hope that there would be a possibility to free him and all the political prisoners and journalists that Russia has detained illegally just in order to uh, exchange them or in order to torture them. We understand that fighting and winning over Russia 
will allow that uh, allow us as a democratic world to do that. And we we just hope that we will be okay. Can I ask you one final question, Kieran? And I, and I mean this. I mean, I know it's close to my heart. I always find it really inspiring to speak to you because we can read, can't we, and hear. But to speak to somebody who's, who's out there and knows what's going on and puts it so clearly as you do. A couple of reports of, um, not unrest, but what is the Ukrainian people's feeling of Zelensky? Still a, a million percent behind him or are there doubters? Um, well, you know, during the war, uh, it's very hard to read into uh, in any numbers, and they change rapidly. What we know is there could not be elections at the time of the war, and we have one president, and we need to stand behind them as politicians and as nation. And uh, it's our physical survivor depends on him being successful at his job of delivering the weapons and of running the army, and that's what we should do. And just bringing it now to those horrific terrorist attacks that we saw take place against innocent people in Russia over the weekend. Do you believe that Putin is putting his people in danger by ignoring the very real threat of ISIS? We know that American security services had actually Warning. forewarned Putin yes. in the weeks leading up to that terrorist attack. Absolutely. And, you know, this is actually the way how Putin came to power. When there were some terrorist attacks in Russia, he dealt with them and he put his upper hand, stronger hand onto Russian people and created his authoritarian regime. So right now he's just playing by his own book. And it's absolutely unfortunate that we will never know the truth what happened there. Because uh, no matter what Russia says and the officials say, there are no international spectators or journalists allowed because why all the international you, journalists are being jailed, Why right? would you believe a word? Yeah. Why would you believe That's a word? Nice Can I just say on a personal level, I will always speak out for Ukraine. It's an absolute pleasure that you came on the show. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you so much. much. And glory to Ukraine. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, thank you there, Ukrainian MP Kira Ruddick. Well, still to come on Talk Today, artificial intelligence, intelligence sorry, could replace up to 8 million workers. And the piece of wood that saved Kate Winslet's character in Titanic sells for more than £700,000 in Texas, only in Texas. Well, The Sun's Jack Elsom and the news newsman's Rebecca Hudson have a final look through this morning's papers next. Do stay with us. It is 8.23. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer.
the UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did supposed fail to, her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 8.26. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Bad news ahead of Easter as the overall price of chocolate rises by 12.5%, meaning that Easter eggs are getting smaller. I won't have it. Unlike badges on French football shirts. We'll do that in the papers next. Well, should MPs be allowed a three-week recess, yeah. given the number of crises the country is currently facing? We'll debate that with two former government workers just before nine. And Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azidi was granted asylum after converting to Christianity. We'll ask a reverend her thoughts at 9.15 this morning. But first, Naz, what's the weather looking like? It's looking a bit better for East time. Great. Sorry, I was just talking to Nick. Um, chocolate, are you going to eat a lot of chocolate? Yes, of course. Good. Are you going to eat a lot of chocolate? Absolutely. I'll have, I'll have to have two now because apparently they're 12.5% smaller. What's your favourite chocolate, mate? Uh, a cream egg. You're like that. Is it the inside? Why yeah. are you grinning? Yeah, it's the, it's the icing in the middle. How do, I've seen her do hers. How do you do yours? I like eating the, middle, the inside of it first. Yeah. With 100%. your tongue? There's the, that's the only way to eat a cream egg. Okay, not a spoon, a tongue, yeah? I like just Cadbury's chocolate crack on. Didn't ask you. Anyway, let's take a look at the weather. <laughs> <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good morning. A real mixed bag of conditions out there for today and for the rest of the week. The only real change is that it might be a tiny bit warmer and a bit calmer into the Easter weekend. Don't worry, it won't be warm enough to melt your Easter eggs for the Easter egg hunt. It's just going to be a bit milder with the sunshine and the lighter winds. But before then, we're still going to see lots of wet weather, hill snow, showers, some of them heavy and thundery with the risk of hail and very strong winds in the next 24 hours from the west. This morning, it is a very wet start across many northern and western parts of the UK. There's a warning from the Met Office for the rain. There's been quite a lot of it. It's fairly persistent across uh, parts of the east of Northern Ireland. That runs out at 10am though and we continue to see spells of rain and showers moving northwards throughout this morning and afternoon. So the mid-afternoon picture for Scotland this afternoon is that of rain and hill snow, mostly above that 300 metres elevation so across the higher routes. Sunshine and showers for Northern Ireland and the same for England and Wales. Now some of these showers could be heavy and thundery, especially out towards western areas. In between there will be some good sunny spells but it won't feel all that mild but temperatures are actually around average for the time of year, up to around 11 to 13 degrees Celsius. Then into tonight, showers will continue for a time across the west. Most of them will fade away, though, and it will become clearer across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland, where a patch of frost is likely. Meanwhile, at the same time, another batch of wet weather heading up across parts of England and Wales. The east of Wales and Midlands, central southern England will be pretty wet by the end of the night, and there will be another area of some heavier downpours down towards Devon and Cornwall. Now, through tomorrow, both areas of rain will be moving northwards throughout the day up towards parts of Scotland, Northern Ireland and across England and Wales, breaking up into showers across England and Wales, again some heavy and thundery, more persistent downpours across Northern Ireland and Southern Scotland, some patchy outbreaks across central areas, the far north mostly fine and bright for much of the day but still quite cold across northern areas and fairly cool further south where it becomes very windy, especially out towards the west with plenty of blustery showers. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Naz. Time now for a final look through this morning's papers with Rebecca Hudson from the News Movement and The Sun's Jack Elson. Team, welcome back. It's all been going on. Can I just say very quickly, good morning to Tom uh, and Darren, who are driving to Southampton, and they love the show. They're obviously oh. deranged and in need of therapy, but thank you very much indeed. <laughs> uh, Jack, um, Express page 24, we're right in it. Alarming child... Harm Rise Sparks Action Call. Can you please talk to me about this story? Yeah, pretty grim story, this. This is a warning from the NSPCC, who has said that since the pandemic, um, cases of child cruelty, neglect and abuse have spiked. And so they've got up 16% 
from 5,372 in 2019-2020 to 6,253 in 22-23. It doesn't really go into the details of the causes behind this, but you'd imagine it was, you know, um, kids basically falling through the cracks, you know, during the pandemic where there wasn't enough, like, face-to-face -face meetings from, like, you know, social services. And, you know, we've seen horrible, horrible cases um, over the years. But, it's, yeah, it's just a bit of a... Um, bit of a sort of horrible statistic, really. Awful. Mm. Absolutely awful. And I think it just shows the necessity for those early interventions from social services, from the variant government agencies, to stop these horrendous cases escalating and identifying those signs of abuse, signs of neglect, you know, chaotic households early on. I'm going to go yeah. right out there with this. <laughs> uh -huh. I, I, actually, I actually think that social services... Um, never get any compliment for the good work they do and get slagged mm. off quite rightly for the bad things that can happen. I just don't understand. It breaks my heart, as I know it breaks mm. your heart now. When I see kids being badly treated, and some of those stories break your heart, and there is, of course, the old adage, and somebody's getting around the table, is going to go, you've got six, yeah, well, I go to work and protect mine. I just think you have to pass the test to drive a car, and I'm afraid a lot of people, maybe, there are people who just shouldn't be having children in the first place. I know we can't quantify that and we can blame, like, oh, in the pandemic, you know, people got yeah. dogs and treated them badly. It's a human being, for God's sake. If you're yeah. not up, even if times are bad, to put your kid first before yourself, there's something sadly wrong or with you. Or, you know, and obviously there there's are always no going to be for child children who disgusting. slip through the cracks, yeah. but there need to be yeah. improved social services, and particularly what was that? Do you remember that for those early years. story over Christmas where the, he died, that boy, and, and they'd gone around and knocked on the window. Yeah. I mean, jeez. Yeah. It was left for, like, nine dad, days. Yeah. died yeah. of a cardiac arrest, yeah. I believe. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah, the, the poor poor boy uh, And the away. woman went, what a disgrace. And I felt myself shouting at the television game, well, why didn't you go and check on your mm. son then for the three weeks you weren't with him? I just... Mm. I don't... I, I just doesn't sit with me. No, yeah. no not at all. Uh, Becca, let's move on now to a story in The Telegraph. Weak army would not last two months against Putin. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is the deputy chief of the defence staff who was saying yesterday that we are... There's a huge kind of operational risk that the UK's defence forces are so depleted yeah. that if we were to get drawn into a sort of deeper conflict with Ukraine and had to go and, you know, staff, uh, you know, man a front line or get into um, proper combat with Russia, that we would literally only be able to last two months with the reserves and the forces that we have. Um, and this kind of comes, um, you know, there was lots of pressure on the budget to potentially increase defence spending. It didn't happen. Um, there was that talk a while ago, wasn't there, about conscripting young people yeah. as a way of kind of how do we, you know, ensure that we have enough people to go and actually fight. And I think this, this is very stark, isn't it? Because, you know, Russia clearly have got no, you know, that conflict shows no sign of of ending. You've got Macron making noises about potentially deploying, you know, would support NATO activity to combat Russia. So it's not beyond let, the realms of possibility. Right, we just had Keir Roddick on the Ukrainian MP. Mm. Let's be honest. If, if Vladimir Putin is successful in Ukraine and puts mm. one foot outside NATO, and whatever Donald mm. Trump might or might not say, right, uh, America uh, and NATO and Europe would all be as one. Mm. I think that's one side of the argument. I don't think... I mean, I find it astonishing that our foreign secretary now is the guy that created all these cuts. I, I do believe, mm. as a nation, we should have a stronger armed force, a Jack. And actually, interesting, yesterday, Jonathan Ashworth, the Labour MP, said, we are going to commit to it. Now, the manifestos will come out. I get the cost of living, but it's a bit like the Ukraine war. Thing. We need to spend more. We are turning, I'm afraid, into a bit of a joke. We've got three ships, haven't we, about five tanks, and I'm not even making it up. Yeah, no, I mean, the army's been sort of whittled down, whittled down you know, over the past Starting 10 years. Starting with Cameron. Yeah, exactly. It's as the Tories came into power. And there are many Tory MPs now, interestingly, that are saying, you know, it's all well and good having tax cuts, OK? And I think that everyone can understand that there's a need for that. However, we're not getting credit for it at all. What would be a really good, I think, you, gesture... Why do you think that is, mate? I said this three weeks ago. You know when that whole thing about tax yeah. cuts was coming? Mm. In the old days, people have gone, yeah... The British public, right, have wised up to yeah, politicians, exactly. so will go, oh, you're going to give me a, a tax cut, but I'm going to be screwed in six months' time and have to pay it back. Mm. I don't mm. agree. I think if you ask the British people, yeah. I think the military uh, support thing would garner huge... Yeah. And, and if exactly. I was in charge of the Tory party, I'd be banging that out before the next election. Exactly. Any sort of headroom you could use yes. to actually to go, we're going to meet that 2.5%, which we promised we were going to meet for a long time now. Yes. I mean, if there's any time to do it, look at the state of the world at the moment. You know, you have crisis in the Middle East, you have war in Europe, you know, you have, you know, a sort of more muscular China. Please. You know, it, it, seems, it seems a no-brainer for a lot of people. I've got a question for both of you. Why on earth would the Deputy Chief of the <laughs> Defence Staff admit publicly 
but we could only afford to fight mm. somebody for two months. Because he's obviously about to resign, isn't he? You'll be sacked. Well, why? I, like, I, it just, I, I've never understood this. No, why yeah, somebody yeah, from pressure. within the defence sector would actually admit publicly to something like this. But, but you know what we were saying earlier about how all these politicians are circling, who should I support, who should I throw my yeah. thing at? Maybe he's gone, I want... I mean, I'm, maybe I'm being cynical. I'm going to hopefully get the top job. Maybe somebody who's going to be the next... that is going to do that. I don't know, but that's what they all do, don't but they? It, it's, it's, I agree with it's you. It's proving how vulnerable we are Absolutely. as a country, yep. which is the surely the first rule of defence yeah. yeah. not to admit your vulnerability. I would assume it's to kind of drum up conversations like sure. this so that they are kind of shoring up support for this for this kind of spending. Where do you stand on this? I actually, I, I actually would agree with it because I also think that then those poor, the people that do go and serve in our armed forces at the moment are so poorly resourced, it feels mm -hmm. kind of irresponsible that we would send people out to go and defend mm -hmm. this country without the necessary equipment, support, ammunitions, training that we need. I think it, we, it leaves people very exposed who choose to kind of give their I lives. I think the rhetoric has changed and I think the people yeah. five years ago, you know, we used to say you couldn't say immigration ten years ago, you'd be called racist. I think five years ago if you talked about military, they'd go, come on. But I think people understand. We're in China this week that actually the world... The world is a more dangerous yeah. place. Yeah. Well, speaking of China, artificial mm. intelligence, mm. not only the, the threat of hacking from abroad, We're but done. the threat of artifi artificial yeah. intelligence from within the UK could actually replace up to 8 million... In the next five years. Work. In five eight years. 8 million jobs within the next five years, apparently, from the Institute for Public Policy Research. Now, it says the most jobs at risk are secretaries, human resources staff, call centre agents, salespeople, and even authors. The idea that AI could sort of write a book in a novel. Mm. I, get the call I get the call centre thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I hate it though because we we spoke about a story last week, didn't we? That HMRC now mm -hmm. are getting rid yeah. of their yeah. phone calls. Yeah. Is this because people want to work from home or because AI will will increase it's cheaper. productivity? Much cheaper. It's not because yeah. people yeah. want to work from home. I... So they'll replace. Yes. Yeah. They will okay. replace us with it. A... We are coming back <laughs> in three. <laughs> but what would they replace us with? Um, <laughs> so what is this going to mean for society as a whole? Yeah, Eight million workers, what's that as a percentage of our workforce? Presumably, what, there's like 70 million people in the UK. There's like 27 million workers, I think, in Yeah, so that's like mm. a third of the workforce. Yeah. 30% of the isn't workforce yeah. gone. Yeah, mm. it's incredible, isn't it? And you think, what jobs are these people going to do? Yeah. You know, they can't just be sort of idling at home, you know? They wouldn't get any sort of purpose in life. So is this why there's an argument for universal basic income, which is often spoken about, because, you know, eventually there might not be enough jobs for anybody. So what, we'll just get a, a set payment from the state and that's it? Yeah, well, you can imagine, you know, kind of with a work landscape like this, you would need something like that. Unless people are going to all be upskilled into how to kind of build AI, which isn't necessarily very transferable if you're used to working in a call centre. I mean, like, what, what do you do? And you can imagine lots of companies would be very excited about replacing a human workforce with a load of algorithms that will do all the work for nothing. But where, Much more reliable. But the, the only sector yeah. I can think of that would need a huge injection of workers is the care sector. Mm. As we get an ageing population, it's all to do with technological advances, isn't it? Mm. The more we advance medically, the longer we're living, the more we need younger care workers to look after people. And maybe that's going to be a sector that's going to have a huge influx of people from within the UK. I think mm. I'm quite glad I'm 60. Do you, do you worry for the next generation? I worry for myself, yeah. No, no, <laughs> am, no, am I the generation? Talking about for our kids. For our kids. Oh, what, you, the do. kids we've just had. Um, yeah, that sounded like we'd had no, them together. No, I think, I think <laughs> our children will change the world, Jeremy. I think it'll all be yes. OK by the time they're in their 30s. I, do you so. think so? Fingers crossed. Yes. Uh, Rebecca, please oh talk gosh. to me about a piece of wood that saved <laughs> Kate Winslet's character. But crucially, was not big enough to save Leonardo DiCaprio. No, it wasn't. So this is the, the famous scene in Titanic where at the very end, Kate is clinging on to a piece of wood and... and Impeccable. Jack. Um, Kate Winslow impression there. Are you ready to go back to Titanic? Oh my gosh, you're so good at this. Wow. Um, but so that prop that she's uh, that she's kind of floating on um, has been sold for seven hundred thousand dollars in an auction in Texas. Um, only in Texas. Only in Texas, because it is a piece of cinema history it is, and it has sparked the enduring debate about was there enough room on that plank of wood for her and uh, Jack. Curiously, our Jack hasn't seen Titanic, so this whole what? story oh, no, I've never seen is lost. You're him. kidding me. You've never seen you Titanic. I, I, I had a masterclass from Bex and um, our director Lucy upstairs. I'll get into yeah. trouble, I'm not bothered. Um, basically, they just had sex in a car and then he dies in the sea. The big iceberg, and then everybody, then she ends up in New York. That's one, one view. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Thanks very much. Um, well, it's a good, it's a good, it's, it's amazing. And, and 
Kate Winslet, who, by the way, this is an absolutely true story. I was born in Reading, Berkshire, and mm -hmm. went to the theatre school my brother did with Kate Winslet. Oh, my gosh. It, years and years ago. What, a, what an amazing British actress, and what a film. It's an iconic yeah. film. Yes. It's iconic. You've got to watch it. Why haven't you watched it yeah. with Mrs Elson? She's never got the time. What does Mrs Elson want to watch, then? Well, she's not Mrs Elson just yet, but oh, she, she has, will she, be. She has watched it. She has watched it. Ah. Uh, I have a confession to make. Mm. I once uh, recreated the door from Titanic to the exact measurements. I did make it out of polystyrene. No. So uh, you've played a, a door? No, no, for a fancy dress party. Oh I went as Jack and my partner Nick Ash... Uh, sorry, I went as Kate, my okay, partner Nick Here we Ash go. Ash now the relationship is coming out. I wanted to cross-dress as well. But um, we, yeah, we tested it out and we can confirm there was indeed enough space for both Jack and Kate to be oh. on that door, but I did crush the polystyrene, so it did break. <laughs> but there was, enough, there was enough room for both you know, of us. You, know, you, know, you do amaze me every day, because I could have put money on the fact that you'd have gone, what you don't know is I actually went for that audition, but my agent said I wasn't good enough for it or something. Well, well I was about five years old, but thank you very yeah, much, no, Jeremy, for thinking that... Um, very true. <laughs> you were one of the children, true. women and Yes, children. thank you very Let's much. talk Easter. Yes. We've gone from Titanic to Easter, and the cost of Easter eggs has gone up by 12.5%. I know. Shrinkflation, is that, what is that? Well, no, so, so, so shrinkflation is where things get more expensive. The actual size of the chocolate egg or the chocolate bar gets much smaller, which we are seeing on an Unlike epic scale. Unlike the French cockerel. Unlike the French cockerel, exactly, which obviously is too big. Um, but um, cocoa, apparently, is now trading at £7,900 a tonne. Am I going to be told that this is to do with the Ukrainian war or the Suez Canal or something? I, don't know, I think it's just inflation, you know, like, uh, obviously, you know, prices are going up around the world and, uh, and this is part of it, you know. Maybe there's some sort of, you know, trade aspect of it. Uh, the price of chocolate has increased by 12.6%, although some brands, including Lint, my favourite, uh, mm -hmm. it's gone up by at least 50% in mm -hmm. some places more than a year ago. So That's uh, great. We're being told we're going to move on because there is an amazing last story, oh, Nick, isn't there? I love this story so much. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, us through it. this good Samaritan, Janet, was walking home, thought she had spotted a poor baby hedgehog that had been abandoned by its mum, scooped it up, took it back to her house, gave it some cat food, a glass of milk, kept it warm, only to discover that it wasn't a baby hedgehog, but it was, in fact, the bobble on a bobble hat. Can I share a really quick story yeah. with you? Once filmed an episode with a kid who was really, really ill and his dream was to go to Chester Zoo very, very quickly and his whole thing was lemurs and there's an island surrounded by water and they say, Jez, you've got to carry the kid across through the waiting thing. And I went, oh, my God, they're like squirrels, they'll be ever. So, listen, Jez, just... <laughs> Just the kids doing it with his dad, just bend down, little bit of banana from a bucket and just feed it to one of these lemurs, we'll get the shot and you're out of there. And I thought, I can't do this. Anyway, I got over there, the kid and everything, and I bent down because it was a really, really quiet lemur and fed it a piece of banana and the cameraman said, that's the end of the microphone, you total idiot. <laughs> the grey, grey, fluffy bit, you complete oh. idiot, which is why I completely you understand believe? the story. That is genuinely true. I fed me. the end oh. of a microphone. Good grief. Magic oh. would have been a great clip, wouldn't it? <laughs> no, it would have been a great clip. Everybody watched it. I back to the studio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and they went, you're such a... Oh, my God. They didn't, they didn't, you know, you know. Oh. Uh, Jack, <laughs> tell us a story about seagulls. We've been reliably informed you have... <laughs> oh, my goodness me. So, in Liverpool, they now have giant seagulls which are eating everything on the beach. They've taken to call of them calm XL, down, calm down. XL <laughs> gullies because they're so massive. And it looks like they've been going to the gym, according to some locals. Debbie O'Reilly... Uh, Liverpool says, they'll take your food from you as soon as they see the Greg's bag. They come from nowhere, <laughs> swoop, and it's gone. So people in Liverpool are currently being absolutely uh, demonised by these horrible um, seagulls who the Daily Star brands giant flying psycho scumbags um, in, in their headline. Um, but obviously, you know, the Daily Star... <laughs> Well known as a vendetta in a campaign against seagulls, but you know, it sounds like uh, the people of Liverpool are um, not faring too well against these. My favourite time with you two. Thank you so <laughs> Thank much. You. Thank you both for joining us this morning, Rebecca Hudson from the News Movement and the Sun's Jack Elson. Well, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions all morning, haven't you? Mostly about Tory MPs quitting. 63 today. Many people saying, call an election, for goodness sake. It's becoming a joke. Um, Hannah says, the Conservatives have deceived us over these years. They've passed themselves off as something they weren't, which primarily explains why Britain is on its knees. Miranda says, I'm 55 years old and I've never voted, but this time I'm going for it. It's time for a total paradigm shift not more of the same. Very interesting. Dan from Epsom texted, in the past few years, the Tories have ruined Britain with their immigration policy after surviving the mess dished out by the Tories. How the hell can we vote for them again? Well, still to come on Talk Today. School's out for MPs, but should they still be taking this many breaks, given the amount of crises we're going through at the moment? We'll be debating that next. This is Talk Today. It is...
Oh, sorry, it's quarter to nine. A very good morning to you. Goodness. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Uh, welcome back. We've talked today, 12 minutes to 9 o'clock. Now, MPs are on recess since yesterday and won't be back until the 15th of April, which is part of their 100 days of holiday a year. But should MPs still be taking these many breaks during parliamentary sessions, given the number of ongoing crises in the UK? Well, Claire Pearsall works in Parliament and says, she's re says recess is very important, but former Private Secretary to Margaret Thatcher, Caroline Slocock, says the amount of recess is self-indulgent. Ladies, over to you. I'll start with you. You, uh, Claire Pearsall, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Come on, though. The world's in crisis and MPs are having 100 days. They need to come back to Parliament and sort out this country, don't they, Claire? Right, but it's not a holiday. If you think that uh, MPs are just going to go and sit on their hands or sit on the beach, then you are much mistaken. The majority of them will work incredibly hard in their constituencies, catch up with all of the businesses that they can't see during sitting times, they will go and meet with constituents and they'll obviously go and uh, campaign where there are upcoming local elections. So it is really important. And I'm not sure what it is you require them to do, because sitting in the chamber of the House of Commons isn't actually going to make a huge amount of difference. A lot of work is going to go on. Bills will still be put through departments. Those ministers in those departments will still be working. Parliamentary questions will still be laid. The business of Parliament does go on. It doesn't physically require their bottoms to be on their green benches in the chamber. Caroline, just bringing you in, you believe the opposite. You think that MPs have too much recess. Can you explain why? 
Well, the amount that they've been spending in recess has been creeping up progressively since 1979. And um, I think the whole system is based on a day when MPs were expected to have second jobs. But now we expect them to be focused on the task in hand. I mean, I totally agree that they have other things to do, constituency work, for example. Uh, but actually, the job of scrutinising government is really critically important. And I think that uh, they become a bit of a rubber stamp. Meanwhile, life goes on and, you know, a lot of things happen when they're away. And I think to a degree, I think it suits the government um, to have you know, them out, uh, out to play, as it were, uh, for such a long period of time. Uh, because you know they've they've increasingly reduced the amount of parliamentary scrutiny of legislation. They're, they're depending increasingly on secondary legislation, for example. But as you know, the people need MPs to be working uh, and and doing the job. And, and we even have a situation where MPs are not even doing the job during the session. So, for example, Matt Hancock, you know, going out to I'm a celebrity, uh, get me out of here, you know, with a fee of 400,000. And, uh, you know, MPs like Nadine Doris, who have sort of second jobs, um, you know, had second jobs, uh, you know, running programmes. Um, I would say I this, I would say this, actually, to bring you back in, Claire, for me, it's about optics. And, and uh, Caroline is, I think, right. I, I get that. It, it's, it, it might be about scrutiny. It's also about optics. F for people in politics, I don't think they quite grasp how the British public feel about politics et al right now. I think that the popularity of all politicians has never been lower. I think the British public's trust or even interest in politicians has never been lower. And I would have thought that in the middle of everything that's going on, the very least they should do is maybe take a few... I don't know. It just, I get what you're saying, but somehow, when they're not in Westminster, you, you get the feeling, I suspect a lot of people, that not much is going on. Do you understand where I'm coming from? I'm talking optics, Claire. Yeah, no, I completely get that. You want to be able to see them scrutinising legislation, asking questions, holding governments to account and ministers to account. But also, how many times have you contacted your own MP? Do you know what that MP does? And I'm just thinking about uh, the lady well, I worked for. My most mornings, Tobias Elwood. Appointments today. I do I know. I've, I found out the other day it's Tobias Elwood, so he's on this show most mornings, well, to be fair. Busy. We should let him get back to work and do proper constituency what, what do you, work. Do you know what I mean, though, about optics? You sure. understand that. Well, in that case, do you think teachers have too much holiday, Jeremy? Yes, far too much. Yes? Yeah, I do. Well, they have less holiday than MPs, so-called holiday, yeah. because when teachers are not in all term marking, time. They also weeks. have to do marking. They also have to do lesson plans. Is that not right, Caroline? Like, there are other things that MPs have to do. How are they going to have time to do that if they're not in recess? I think we need a bit but more it's, transparency. It's also the fact that some constituencies... Oh, oh. Go on, Caroline, just stay there a second, Pierce, till you're getting too gobby. I'm joking. Caroline, all yours. Yeah, I just think we need some more transparency. I mean, that MPs ought to have an agreement about how much holiday they actually have, and it shouldn't be any more than the rest of us. And they should be telling us, telling constituents, how they use their time. You know, I accept that not all of it will be in the chamber of the House, but I think we need to know more about how that time is being used. You know, if it's being used to get large fees for, you know, running um, television programmes, then, you know, that's not necessarily in constituents' interests. So I think a, a lot more transparency around this would be good. And a lot more, you know, I think the government needs to kind of give them, also MPs, more of a role in scrutinising legislation than they are currently doing. Mm. And Claire, would you support that? Uh, more accountability for how MPs spend their time. We know that there were certain MPs last year, your favourite Boris Johnson certainly didn't vote for an, a large period of time whilst he remained as an MP in his constituency. Do you think we need to hold these MPs more accountable for what they're doing and how long they're doing it for? Yeah, absolutely. I don't see there's anything wrong with transparency. You want to know what your constituency MP is doing, how many businesses they've seen, what kind of problems that they deal with. Because I think sometimes people don't understand what it is MPs have to get involved with. So I think, yeah, absolutely, uh, transparency is key. And I think Caroline is right that spending time um, in the jungle or writing books or presenting programmes shouldn't happen. If you're an MP, you should be proud to be an MP. You're there to serve the people. So I absolutely agree with that. But it's not that they're on holiday. 
and I really feel very strongly about this because the amount of work that goes on in constituencies is huge, especially those um, whose constituencies are far from Westminster. They need that time to catch up if you're well, on the... not right in saying quickly that they go home anyway on a Thursday, don't they, every weekend to their constituencies, don't they? Not, not everybody. Oh. There are sitting Fridays, there are committee meetings. So if you are an MP in the South West, for example, you may not leave until Friday afternoon. You're not going to get home till late Friday evening and you're going to be travelling back Sunday evening to London. So it doesn't give you an awful lot of time. Now, I know there's not going to be any sympathy. I completely understand that. But people should ask their MPs what it is they're getting up to. Most of them will be very proud to say what businesses they've done, what um, uh, constituents cases they've taken up. Uh, really, really quickly, Caroline, your uh, former private secretary to Margaret Thatcher, how much time did she spend, obviously, in her term as Prime Minister, in her constituency Grantham. fighting for constituency-based issues? Ten seconds. She used to go every Friday and she took it very seriously and she had a very competent constituency secretary as well. Oh, fabulous. A very succinct answer. Thank you very much. Thank Caroline. you both. Claire Thank Pearsall you, Claire and Pearsall. Caroline Slocott. Lots more still to come on the show, including... This is brilliant. Fresh chaos for the Tory party as two ministers quit in one day. Former number 10 Director of Communications, Jonathan Haslam, joins us next. This is Talk Today. It's almost nine o'clock. We're coming back. Please join us. Otherwise, we'll be here on our own. ta -ra. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have moved on from era. that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV.
This is Talk Today with Jeremy Kyle and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning. It's nine o'clock on Wednesday, the 27th of March. It absolutely is. And you would talk today, my friends, on TV, on radio, of course, online on your smart speaker. And these are Wednesday morning's top stories. Continued Tory turmoil. A double resignation forces Rishi Sunak into a mini reshuffle as Education Minister Robert Halfen and Armed Forces Minister James Heapy both quit their posts. Out of office, as MP set off for three weeks of Easter recess, we'll ask... Do they really deserve that amount of leave? We'll discuss the optics with the former head of comms for Number 10 Downing Street. And how did this happen? New images show Clapham attacker and convicted sex offender Abdul Azidi being baptised as documents reveal he was granted asylum after converting to Christianity. And lots of sunshine once again for today, but also plenty of showers, some heavy, some thundery, with hail and even some hill snow out there. I'll have all the details in the forecast at the end of the programme. Cheers, Naz. Now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. The search for six missing people following the bridge disaster in Baltimore has come to an end. As rescuers say, they're now presumed dead. The Coast Guard says it suspended its recovery efforts following the major incident yesterday, which saw a large cargo ship collide into one of the city's main crossings. Several vehicles were on the bridge at the time it fell into the river. And officials have since revealed that the vessel suffered power problems before it issued a distress call moments before the crash. Back here, and there are concerns of a continuing exodus from the Conservatives after two ministers announced their departure from the party. Robert Halfham became the 63rd politician to say he'll not stand in the next election. And he was joined by the Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who also resigned. Well, it triggered a mini reshuffle for Rishi Sunak. And chief political correspondent for The Times, Aubrey Allegretti, has told Talk Today that his days are numbered as the party prepares for his departure. You've got all sorts of candidates vying behind the scenes, people like Cammy Badnock, people like Grant Shapps. Uh, James Cleverley is a sort of dark horse. People don't talk about him as much, but he probably would be somebody who would go for it in the future as well. So all of that kind of manoeuvring and anticipation is already happening now. A new survey has revealed that public satisfaction with the NHS has hit a new record low. The long-running British Social Attitudes research shows that just 24% of people were happy with services in 2023, with most people concerned about waiting times and staff shortages. It's a 5% decline since the previous year. And Wales manager Rob Page says football's a cruel game after they missed out on a place at Euro 2024. Daniel James failed to secure the vital spot kick as they lost their playoff final against Poland in a penalty shootout. And the tie finished goalless following extra time in Cardiff. Absolutely gutted for them. Yeah, it's a, it is a horrible way to go out, isn't it? And, uh, and it is a cruel game. So... Um, Really disappointed right now, but really proud of the players. And that was a message to them in the changing room after, you know, for what the campaign overall, I couldn't be more proud. You're up to date with the headlines. We'll have more updates later on. Thanks, Em. Before we get back to the top story, thank you for all your comments today. We just did a debate before the 9 o'clock news about whether MPs should actually get 100 days of holiday a year. And we had all those people saying, oh, they have to go back to their constituencies and do some paperwork. I mean, the average Joe doesn't really agree. They need to speak to their constituents. I do agree with that, because otherwise you've got people like, say, for example, Blackpool North's MP spending all of their time in London. They've got to get back to their constituents and see what their Elder, biggest issues Elder are. Elder don't agree with you. Elder says the country's collapsing and here are MPs going on their jollies. I wonder if this is before or after they announced their pay rise for the last year. Well, I hear you, Hilda. Stephen says most of us think it's not right for an MP to have a three-week recess, but in hindsight, the answer has to be yes. Most of the MPs will spend time dealing with constituency matters and problems of their constituents. See? Austin says, why on earth do they need three weeks? I get Easter Day and Good Friday off. Why can't they be like the rest of us? We don't even get Easter Monday off. Well, you're off for two... How, how long are you taking off at Easter, Jeremy Kyle? Rian says, let's make it a three-decade recess and we might stand a damn chance of recovering because they've all messed everything up. Right, well, on to... <clears throat> speaking of messing everything up, onto our top story <clears throat> today. Fresh chaos for the Tory party as two more MPs quit, forcing Rishi Sunak to organise a mini reshuffle. Uh, James Heapy has been replaced by Leo Doherty, yes, who I know, as Armed Forces Minister. And in a change to the education role, Robert Halfen has stepped aside and been replaced by Luke Cord. Yes, I know. Well, we're joined now by former Number 10 Director of Communications, Jonathan Haslam. Jonathan, what message is this going to be giving to the remaining members yeah, of the Tory yeah. party and the wider electorate? Good morning, Nicola and Jeremy. Uh, the message is actually quite a lot of people have given up. 
Right. And uh, you look for signs in, in history and cycles. Go back to 2010. 150 MPs decided that they weren't going to stand at the next election. Is that right? Remember, in ministers, yeah, a vast majority of those were Labour MPs. 13 years in power, they saw the end coming. The charismatic Gordon Brown really wasn't cutting it for the electorate. Um, and to be fair, there had been a global financial crisis. Now we've got about 98 who said they're not going to stand at the next election. 63 Tories, but actually you've got four who've had the whip removed. So you've got people like Bob Stewart mm -hmm. and Crispin Blunt, Julian Knight, uh, and of course, Matt Hancock, remember him? Mm. So that takes you up to about 67 Tories, some of which we can absolutely easily do without. These two, Heapy and um, uh, Robert Halfen, that's a great shame, actually, good for the country. Yeah. Good MP, good ministers, too. Halfen was a thorn in the side of the government when he was in chair of the Select Committee on Education and has become an extremely effective education minister. He's really good on apprenticeships, apart from anything else, and he's seen as a very genuine guy. James Heapy, uh, army background, uh, fought in Afghanistan, distinguished, uh, has made no uh, bones about the fact he thinks we should be spending 2.5% of GDP mm. on defence, um, and is going back after a very short time in public life. And that's a great shame. The, bub the public actually is missing out because of that talent. It's really interesting what you said about um, giving up, right? We have to, you know, as a broadcaster, we have to say the people will decide and whatever. But what's really interesting is, is that in the last six months, in the, in the, the last throes of many administrations, as you say, people decide that they're going to give up. And then you see all these self-serving MPs jockeying for position. It's all about timing, isn't it? Do I, do I walk out on something that's going to fail? Do I hang around and try and pick up the, 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 the baton? Or do I align myself to the person who might pick up the baton? Or do I know? And so all of a sudden, it, 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 you know, the agreement between everybody, and you'll see it, Shaps yesterday spoke out and basically put pressure on the PM and said, we need to spend more money on defence. He's been the yes. defence secretary for about three days. He's had about 14 jobs in a year, and patently he wants to run for leader. And then for the next six months, everybody's saying their own bits for their own ends. And this is how I see it. So why don't they just call an election, Jonathan? Uh -huh. Well, because hope springs eternal, Jeremy. Hope springs and eternal, That's Bob what you're looking at. You've got Rwanda bill coming through uh, after Easter. Yep. We'll, pro we'll probably see a person. And other, what other the three other... weeks while they're eating chocolate on oh, recess? Rwanda yeah. just carries on, does it? Well, I'm afraid it does, yeah, yes. Yeah, We've, yeah. We spend okay. a lot of money. But the important thing is that we get somebody who's not a government minister out to Rwanda. Uh, and that happens. And, and that's one opportunity. Interest rates, most of the markets are putting 7.75% in three cuts down. We'll follow the American Fed in that aspect. But by the end of the year, interest rates will be down, mortgage rates might come down as well. That's all priced in. So if your Rishi Sunak is saying, look, what matters? Are you feeling better economically? And that's where we might get to if we push to November, which is, I think, probably where we're going to end up. Yeah. Do you really think people will feel better off economically by November? No. No. Because it takes <laughs> far too long, Brilliant. far too yeah. long for all of these things to feed through. So I think there's a very good economic case for getting rid of the or reducing national insurance charges. It takes time for people to feel it. Um, I think that people need to understand that the dynamic changes. I think, the dynamic, it, Jonathan, I, I think the dynamics changed in politics. I know everybody says he's off again, but I do think it's true. I'm not sure that the British public are as gullible as they perhaps were in the past. I think I that don't when... think the British public have ever been gullible, I Jeremy. Do. I, I, do. I honestly think that the British public are smarter. When, we yeah, just, I agree. When push just, comes to shove, when you've yeah, got to put your cross in the box, right? Absolutely. At that yeah. time. At Otherwise, that we expect them to get on with and it. And I said it earlier. Why, the British public going, do you know what? We don't actually want your tax cuts because we know we're going to have to pay it back in a bit. That would never have happened. What I'm saying is I think they're more switched on and I think they might go, well, OK, so he'll tax this and drop this and maybe by November it all sounds a lot better, but the pan in my pocket still ain't what it was before and that will be the judgment. It will. Too late. That is the, the issue with inflation because although inflation comes down, there has been a ratcheting it up of prices and they're not coming down. Now, we want your advice, so stay where you are, Nick. 
Oh, sorry, me. I thought you were talking to Nick Ellaby because uh, Labour... Very good. Yes, Labour, if elected, say that they're planning to invest in floating wind farms off Britain's coast in a bid to reduce the UK's reliance on foreign energy. Now, this pledge arrives after recent figures revealed that the UK imported nearly half of its energy in 2022. Our intrepid Talk Today correspondent, Nicholas Ellaby Jr., has been visiting a wind farm in Eaglesham, in the south side of Glasgow, and he sent this... Well, Morning, Jeremy. Morning, Nicola. The plan today was to show you some of Britain's biggest onshore wind farm. I'm, I'm here at Whiteley, just south of Glasgow. There are 215 turbines here, but currently we can only see about one and a half of them. Lovely spring day here in, in Scotland. Uh, but we're here talking about wind farms because Keir Starmer is promising to pump more money into decarbonising Britain's energy system. Here, there are 215 turbines, each producing enough electricity to power about 1,600 homes. What Keir Starmer's planning to do, if he gets into government, which is probably a given at this stage, is to put more money into investment into offshore and floating wind farms to try and take carbon production out of our energy production system by 2030. Now, he's going to come up against a couple of problems with this plan. One is the money. It's a lot of, a lot of money to cost to build each turbine. I mean, they're about 150 metres high uh, and Britain's finances are in absolute dire straits, as we all know. The other thing is the steel. Britain's steel industry is already scaling black. We've seen the Tata steel plant at Port Talbot in Wales and also Scunthorpe closing down furnaces. And that means in future we're going to have to import a lot of steel. Each of these things weighs 200 tonnes. It's the same as a blue whale. It's a very, very steel-hungry hung industry. And to do this, we're going to have to end up importing lots of steel and we'll be beholden to, to price rises. So that could scupper those plans. And then in terms of where he's going to find to build them, you know, Britain already has about 15 offshore wind farms. There are only two floating ones. He's going to have to find the right places to do that and also to go through the right ecological checks as well. In terms of building near people, I mean, a very small sample size. I've spoken to a couple of dog walkers this morning and people in Eaglesham, the nearby town, and they tell me actually there's no problem living next to these onshore wind farms. You can only really hear them when you get close and you can't really see them as well once you get away uh, towards the built up areas. So, you know, I think people are happy to live near them if it means cheaper electricity but certainly potential uh, potential problems in the works if if, if Keir Starmer wants to, to decarbonize our, our power production by 2030 as Labour are promising guys well, um, thank you very much Nick Ellaby reporting from Eaglesham there it sort of sums up today that we've sent him to look at a wind farm and there's such a blizzard he can't see anything on a serious note Jonathan um, Energy is going to be a big central debate in the in the next election. Labour, we're going to spend 28 billion turning it green. Oh, that's been rode back on. Um, where do you stand on this? Does anybody have a plan that's workable? Uh, no, well, governments have been hopelessly slow on it. And uh, Starmer's idea that you'll get carbon free by 2030 is for the birds. Energy and wind farms are important, but let's not forget. We do need an infrastructure that can cope with it and get us the power that we need for the, all these electric cars that are going to be driving in a few years' time. So it's expensive, but the private sector can step up to the plate. I'm still finding it really difficult to get my head around the idea of a floating wind farm <laughs> that's 200 tonnes worth of How metal. How do you tie it's it up? It's incredible. When, what if the bre it breaks and it floats away? Oh, I don't know. You just have to hope it's not going near a bridge because we've seen it's more than enough disasters about that. Absolutely. Yeah. And Jonathan, the tragedy there, Nicola. A quick comment from you on this three-week Easter recess. Do you think that MPs spend too much time in recess or is it just about right? The country runs better when civil servants are left in charge. <laughs> really? <laughs> Very good. Absolutely. Belgium, if man, they're at work, Bel man, Bel they're usually at home. Belgium had the best economic performance when it didn't have a government for more than 20 months. Optics, though, Jonathan, on a serious note, in the current situation doesn't look great, does it? It doesn't matter. You know, they get out, they do other things. You've got to be realistic about what an MP does. Mm -hmm. And actually, if MPs are not quizzing people in the House of Commons, they should be out talking to real people and understanding issues away from the Westminster bubble. 
then they'll understand what the housing crisis means, the cost of living crisis, and redouble their efforts to get it right for the future. Good yeah, man. Here. Well, thank you to former head of comms for number 10, Jonathan Haslam. Thank you, Jonathan. Still to come, the Clapham chemical attacker and convicted sex offender, Abdul Azidi, was baptised to stay in the country despite failing the religious test. We'll speak to a reverend and ask how this was allowed to happen next. This is Talk Today, it's almost what quarter past nine. Do stay with us, we're coming right back. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kingston City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have moved another on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Talk today, 18 minutes past 9 o'clock. Kevin Alex from 9.30 and Peter Carbell in for Julia from 10 o'clock. Now, Cam Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azidi was granted asylum by a judge who accepted he was a Christian convert despite concerns the sex offender was a liar. Well, new images of him being baptised have emerged alongside court documents that showed the asylum seeker said he had joined Grange Road Baptist Church in 2016. Joining us now is Reverend Sally Smith. Sally, good morning. Um, I, have good real morning. I have real issues with this story. Um, this was a, before we talk about the fact that you've baptised asylum seekers, madam, this guy was a convicted sex offender. Does the church not have a responsibility to report people who are, frankly, a liability to society? Well, again, I can, I mean, I can answer that question. Um, and that, in fact, part of my role when I worked for the Church of England, so I'm not representing the Baptist Church that this yeah. case is talking about. Yeah. I worked for the Church of England and was a priest in the Church of England. And part of my role actually was for safeguarding vulnerable adults. 
Um, and that included uh, working with the probation service when someone came out of prison, for instance, and wanted to attend a church. Um, there, would, there was a very strict process in place uh, where, you know, there was a contract in place and there were safeguarding measures to protect other members of the congregation. <clears throat> but I will have to say that in all of my time working for the Church of England mm. and also being involved in the asylum seeking community, I never once had to do a contract for an asylum seeker. The people that I was doing contracts for were white, middle-aged, elderly, church attending sure. gentlemen, but or people would, who were coming under, out of prison. I understand it's yeah. not your church, and I really appreciate it being. You'd understand the frustration of people that this guy, you know, but seemingly Sally, is duping the system. Really, Sally, do you think that the church, in a way, is being blamed here for having allowed this person to to join that particular Baptist church when actually it's the Home Office's responsibility mm -hmm. to decide who uh, should or shouldn't be allowed to leave to remain in this country when they are a convicted sex offender? Yes, I, I think you're right. Um, and I think there are lots of different elements to this case that can't just be pinned onto the fact that he is an asylum seeker. Um, He's a, he obviously had got convictions for sexual offences and for violence. Um, and the, that, I, I am concerned if that wasn't raised in mm, his appeal. Absolutely. And I think that, that's, not, not, that's not the problem of the church, really. That's the problem of agencies, government agencies working together and the probation service, because that certainly should have been... Um, a part of the Sunny, the point, the, the point is, and, and I wish we had more time, I completely understand where you're coming from, but the, the frustration for people is, is that the church, and I have to be really careful, and I know it's not your church, and I appreciate what you said, in trying to be whatever the church tries to be, blatantly this man with a sexual abuse record duped the church to pretend to... I mean, this is the worst part about the story, was that he said, I can't go back to Afghanistan because I will face persecution. And the only reason, Sally, that he will suffer persecution is because he turned to Christianity, is what he said, which for me begs the question to everybody in the church, you're being used by these people. How, how does the church wise up, is what I ge guess I'm saying. Yes? And, and I think that is an important conversation. And clearly he was one of the small percentage of people that abused a system that was set up to, well, the, the, the system of organised religion, really, in this country in many forms and guises, um, in, in all of its different dimensions. And he was a person who clearly abused the system. And I have great compassion for that minister who baptised him because I can see how vulnerable even ministers are and are put in a position of having to make decisions around for people and about people. When trying to be non-judgmental, when trying to acknowledge the fact that people's lives can be turned around, people's lives can be transformed, and yet being able to um, have the wisdom to decide, is this person genuine or, or are they not? And I think that is a pressure, uh, and I personally felt that pressure. Um, and I, But I think this is a much bigger conversation around how clergy is supported, uh, how different agencies work together, what information comes out How in will court. that clergyman be feeling having made that decision? Serious question. I would imagine he would be devastated. And I'm not surprised that he doesn't want to talk about it publicly, because if that were me, I would be absolutely devastated. Nobody wants to be, as you say, used mm -hmm. or taken advantage of or to, to act in a way that can then look back on and considered to be naive. Um, but the fact, I have to stress that the vast majority of asylum seekers do not do the things that, that he has done. He's not representative of the vast majority of people that attend Christian churches up and down this country. And, Sally, at the end of the day, I'm guessing your decision-making is not about who uh, should have leave to remain in the UK, who is or isn't a genuine asylum seeker or who may face prosecution abroad. Your judgment call is whether or not somebody wants to convert to Christianity and, and how could you possibly put, you know, a measure on that? You have to how take someone at their word. How can you see into someone's heart? How can you see someone's relationship with God? How can you hear those silent prayers that are without uttered? Being the boring you know, one, though, Sally, through... without being the boring one, because we ain't got much time, there must be a, a feeling for amongst you that people are you. That's all my thing is, is that you could and should and are being used in certain situations. We have to go, Sally Smith. Thank you so much, and I mean that, for taking time to be on tour today. Uh, we are back tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock. Well, hopefully it'll all work. <laughs> well, Kevin, Kevin and Alex are up next, but here is the weather first with Nas. Have a good Wednesday, Tara.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, there will be some good spells of sunshine out there for this afternoon, but in between there will be some showers, initially starting as showery rain across parts of the southwest and moving northwards, breaking up into showers, some heavy and thundery. And there will be rain and hill snow clearing from Scotland, but later on there will be more showery rain to the south. And as well as that, Northern Ireland will have a pretty wet afternoon. And temperature-wise, we're looking at average highs for the time of year, up to around 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight showers will continue during the evening, then most of them do fade away as they head up towards parts of Scotland. It becomes dry and clear there and for Northern Ireland too with a patchy frost perhaps even for Northern England too. But further south another batch of wet weather will spread across the parts of Wales, the Midlands, Central and Eastern England and also down towards the southwest for Devon and Cornwall there will be some heavy downpours by dawn with very strong winds as well. So tomorrow will be another wet one. Throughout the day we'll see those two areas of wet weather moving northwards and there will be very strong winds developing from the southwest as well. In between, there will be some sunshine at times and drier conditions, particularly around eastern England and the north of Scotland. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman is not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite right Yay. too. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, you put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you speak to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Then I don't 